Vigilance, Another Generation, Academy of Ancients, Book 9. Written by Avery Cross. Narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Chapter 1. Meg. The car came to a stop on the curved drive, and my heart was in my throat. I slumped lower in the back seat. Maybe if I refused to get out, Taylor or the driver would take me somewhere else. Why had my parents thought sending me here was a good idea? Why? In all the years I had to deal with their jobs within the magical government of summoners, why now did they get the bright idea to tuck me away at some damn academy? It's not like I can even use my magic, I muttered under my breath. What was that? Taylor asked. Nothing. Just nothing. I was the daughter of two members of the Academy of Ancients Council. They used to be officials, but recent events had caused the council to grow in order to weed out corruption. For these last couple of years, my life had gone from bearable to hardly tolerable. Everyone assumed I had it made, that this was the life. I wondered what they'd think if they knew the truth about my family and me, if they knew that I had to live a lie every day. Even now, coming here, I had to pretend. Meg, Taylor said, twisting around to look at me. I know this isn't what you wanted, but it's for the best. You have to get out of the car eventually. He'd been the driver for my family for a decade at least. His brown hair had gone gray at the temples, and the wrinkles around his eyes were far more pronounced than they used to be. Like all the others who were close to my family, he'd been sworn to secrecy and bonded to that oath by blood. He also wasn't merely a driver. That was simply his cover. He was one of my parents' most trusted personal guards. Unlike some of the other people I saw daily, Taylor had a fun, more relaxed side. As sad as it was, he was one of the few people I could talk to without worrying what I said would get back to my parents. At least here you won't be followed around by six guards at all times, he added. No, I'll just be the center of attention because I'll look like a crazy person who can't use her magic. Why couldn't I have just, I don't know, stayed home? Hell, I couldn't even remember the last time I'd been home. I tried over and over to get my parents to let me be on my own. It's not like I was a damn kid anymore. But they were terrified the second they left me home alone, even with 20-plus guards, that someone would get to me. That's what happened when they went from simply being in the government to council members. The danger we'd already been living with was amplified and took their paranoia to new heights. Staying home without them there to drive me crazy every day would have been a dream, especially after I'd spent so much time traveling with them from one base to another. I glanced up at Taylor, waiting for him to answer my question. He was scowling, which wasn't normal for him unless something was wrong. What? I asked, sitting forward. Nothing. You don't want to be late meeting Headmaster Hook, do you? I'm not getting out of this car until you tell me what you're hiding. What's going on? He tapped his fingers on the center console. I knew he'd give in. That was the other reason I liked Taylor. He never felt the need to keep me in the dark. Once I was old enough to understand the dangers having my last name entailed, he kept me in the loop. My parents wouldn't even do that. They lied right to my face. And to keep matters simple, I played dumb to make them feel better. The house wards were broken two weeks ago, Taylor told me. Someone made it inside. We're not sure who or how many. Did they take anything? I asked. Two weeks ago, and up until this morning, I was staying with my parents at a fancy chateau reserved for visiting members of the Academy of Ancients Council. They had business to attend to for the next few months in Maine. This academy was the closest one to their location, which is why I thought I was being dumped here instead of being allowed to stay home. Nothing was taken, Taylor replied. He didn't have to say anything else. The intruders hadn't been after something. They'd been after someone. Wouldn't it be safer if I was with them at the chateau? I argued. The notion was brought up, but your parents believe only they're the targets. They don't want you anywhere near them in case there's trouble. I scoffed. You mean they don't want to deal with my depressing moods and have to continually fend off questions about why their daughter doesn't use magic? Megan. It's fine. I cut him off gently. Do they really think I'll be safe here, though? Taylor's scowl turned to a worried frown. 
but he let me change the subject. Aside from once being a fortress, this place has seen its fair share of shit in the past couple of years. Honestly, this campus is probably safer than the government building. The Talons themselves have taken over the security of it. I felt the wards on our drive up the mountain. They were so powerful. The magic that created them still lingered on my skin with a warm touch, as if I'd been standing out in the sun for hours. So there are guards here then. Everyone knew who the Talons were. I hated to admit it, but knowing they were the ones watching over this place did make me feel a little better about being here. Yes, but to them, you're merely another student. They won't pay you any more attention than anyone else. He peered out the car window. You'll finally have a chance to be on your own. Isn't that what you've wanted for a while now? He wasn't wrong. I was 22, and I was more than ready to get out from under my parents' shadows. I learned early on that was probably never going to happen. I'd held on to the hope anyway. My plan had been to go somewhere I wanted to. Alone. Completely and utterly alone. Here, I might be without my parents, but there were so many people. Years of being told I had to be careful that anyone could be a threat made me uneasy around strangers. And there were a ton of those here. After what occurred three years ago, that only made my fear worse. Not that my parents would care about the situation they were putting me in. Not that they'd care that every day was going to be a struggle not to lose it. All they wanted me to do was get over what happened. They wanted to pretend everything was fine. But it wasn't fine. It'd never be fine. They'd already done their job of turning me into a freak. Now I was ten times worse. And they couldn't have cared less. I was nothing more than a nuisance while they tried to handle their new roles as council members. I scooted closer to the car door and took in the campus. For being inside a mountain, it was gorgeous. The buildings were all newer. The grounds were beautifully landscaped. There were gardens everywhere and plenty of room for practicing summoning. It was picturesque and almost perfect. But there were students everywhere. I was late arriving, so they were already in their second week of classes. The students who were new had probably made friends and had their own little study groups. I'd never been in a formal education setting in my life. Ever? And now my parents were just throwing me into one and hoping for the best. I guess I can't bribe you to take me back to the chateau and come up with an excuse for why I can't stay here? I asked Taylor. Unfortunately not. You'll be safe here, Megan. I wouldn't have brought you if I was concerned. I personally know General Pierce, who oversees the Talons. I trust him, and all under his orders, with my life. All right, fine. Sounds like I don't have a choice. His sigh said he was sorry for that, but there was nothing else he could do. Shall I get your bag out of the trunk for you? I nodded, and he climbed out of the car, giving me one more minute to get myself together. You can do this. Just don't talk to anyone. That always makes it easier. Then you won't have to lie to anyone's face. I took a deep breath in, gave myself a firm nod, then climbed out of the car. I tugged on the hem of my long-sleeved gray shirt and smoothed out my jeans, not that there were any wrinkles on them. My hands just needed something to do so they'd stop trembling. I shoved a few stray locks of hair that had fallen from my bun out of my face and straightened. Taylor slammed the trunk shut and came round with my large black travel bag. He handed it to me and I slung it over my shoulder. If you need anything, you can call me, he assured me with a grin. I think you're going to like it here more than you think. And if you're wrong, I'll owe you mango smoothies every morning for a month. I burst out laughing and he joined in. Mango smoothies were my go-to favorite when I was having a shit day. Taylor would always find the places where they made them and bring me one. He was really more of a parent to me than my actual parents sometimes. He paid attention. They were usually too worried about keeping our secret a secret and burying what their daughter had done. Taylor gave me a bear hug, then let me go with an encouraging smile. Forcing myself to turn away from him, I started up the long stone path to the entrance of what I hoped was the main building. The car started up behind me, and the tires crunched over gravel while it pulled away. Not once did I look back. Students walked around me, talking to each other, or had their faces buried in books. Even more were out on the grounds working on their summoning. A fire lesson was taking place not too far from me. 
Bright crimson and orange flames shot into the air now and again. The students were broken off into pairs and sent streaking balls of fire at one another to catch and send back. A woman dressed all in black stood close by, watching them with a critical eye. Her ebony hair was twisted into a thick braid that hung down her back. She had her arms crossed. When she turned her head, gold flecks refracted in her eyes. There was even a rippling over her body like she had some sort of magical shield in place. It was hardly visible. I assumed she was a spirit summoner, but then she stepped forward, speaking to one of the students, and fire formed in her open palm. Spirit and fire? That was a rare and dangerous combination, or so I'd been told. The woman who I realized then had to be one of the instructors was in complete control of her power. She couldn't be that much older than me, though. Who the hell was she? I should have been moving on, but watching her control that fire was fascinating. It turned into a bird and flew around her, then shot up into the sky and exploded into a thousand smaller flames. She held out her hand and they all came right back to her, winding up and around her body. Wishing I could have used my summoning like that, or used it at all without fear of consequences, I grumbled to myself and turned away from the scene. I'd never be able to do anything close to that. Ever. My hand tensed around the strap of my bag, and I picked up the pace. I tried to think of anything other than what occurred the last time I'd used my magic. Flashes of that horrible day came anyway. The skin on my arms prickled uncomfortably. Not here, I whispered under my breath. Please, not here. My breathing became more rapid, and my heartbeat pounded in my ears. I became acutely aware of so many people around me. Strangers. All of them were strangers. I tried to keep walking. The building wasn't that far away. But my feet refused to move. I struggled to repeat the mantra Taylor had me say every time the panic set in. I'm safe. There's no danger. Everything's okay. I just need to breathe. Count to five and breathe. Not caring how much of a crazy person I might look like, I shut my eyes and counted to five, over and over, until my breathing finally evened out. When I opened my eyes, several students were giving me sideways glances. Ducking my head and on shaky legs, I walked as fast as I could to the main building. So much for no one noticing you. Good job, Meg. Once inside, I came to a halt again. This time, it was to take in the space around me. I'd seen plenty of amazing places in my lifetime, but this front entrance was exquisite. The outside had been all stone with a modern touch. The inside had wooden beams that arched overhead. Twisted metal chandeliers covered in hundreds of candles hung from the ceiling. The flames that flickered gave off more light than natural candles would. They must have been lit by fire summoners. Brackets done in the same design lined the walls. Tapestries and paintings decorated the walls as far down the wide hall as I could see. The floor beneath my boots was a warm shade of mahogany hardwood. Everything about it should have been intimidating. Instead, there was a strange, comforting air to the building. It only lasted for a moment. Then I couldn't stop and notice how many students were milling around. My fingers fidgeted against my thigh while I tapped out to the count of five. Ms. Wright... I jumped and glanced to my right. A man the size of a damn linebacker stood there with a pleasant smile on his face. Black hair run through with white streaks hung to his shoulders. He wore simple black slacks and a dark blue button-down shirt that shimmered a little under the soft candlelight. He held out a hand, and after a second, I took it. I'm Headmaster Hook, he said, giving his head a little bow. I hope your trip here was pleasant. Falling into polite mode after so many years of practice, I replied in a light tone, It was, thanks. I'm sorry for arriving so late. Nonsense. You haven't missed much at all. He released my hand. Shall we go to my office to go over your schedule? Your mentor, Nyala, will be joining us shortly. Mentor? Yes, all our first-year students have one. It's so you've got someone to help you if you have questions, and to lend an ear. The first year can be difficult for many students. Some only just now have found out their witches. Others, such as yourself, are attending their first magical-based academy. 
We merely like to ensure that you have support, if necessary. He finished his little speech with that kind smile still plastered on his face. It seemed genuine enough. Inwardly, I sighed. Having a mentor wasn't something I'd planned on dealing with. That was someone who would no doubt try to pry into my life. It'd be someone else I'd have to lie to. I considered asking Headmaster Hook if I could avoid the whole situation, but he was already leading me deeper into the building to give me a tour before we went to his office. I supposed having someone to talk to wouldn't be a terrible idea. Maybe I'd get along with her. I'd never actually had a friend. Now you just sound pathetic. You don't need friends. You don't need anyone. Friends mean people getting close to you. Close means danger of them finding out the truth. Remember what happened the last time. I shoved that nightmare as far back in my mind as it would go and focused on the here and now. Hiding out of my room when I wasn't in class was starting to sound like a great idea. Doing my best to keep a polite, interested smile on my face while Hook continued to join me around, I tried not to picture how terrible this semester was going to be. Chapter 2. Cody From beneath the shade of a tall maple tree, I kept close eye on the newest arrival to the Academy of Ancients. If anything, I was vigilant. It was one of my strengths, after all. Megan Wright, daughter of Lucy and William Wright, members of the council, was finally here. I adjusted my stance, watching her make her way down the path toward the main building. There was no excited smile on her face. She certainly wasn't dressed like other spoiled kids of government officials I'd guarded before. She was dressed as if she wanted to disappear into the crowd. When I was assigned to guard her during her time at Academy, I wasn't told much about her, aside from what was in the file. There'd been hardly anything in there of note, aside from the basic information. Maybe this would be easier than I'd expected. Halfway down the path, she paused to watch the fire summoning lesson taking place on the grounds. Briar Morris was teaching this morning. I hadn't met her in person yet, but I'd heard the stories. Everyone associated with the Talons had. Unfortunately, I'd missed out on all the fun she and Zachary Pierce had. I'd been on assignment at the other end of the country, babysitting some bratty asshole who'd pissed off the wrong crowd. I moved a little closer, waiting for Megan to keep walking. Her entire stance changed, though, like she was frozen in place. Curious, I walked parallel to the path now, alert for any possible threat. As far as I could tell, no one was paying much attention to her. She had one hand wrapped around the strap of her duffel. Her eyes were shut, and her chest rapidly rose and fell with her quickened breathing. Her left hand tapped out a pattern on her thigh. Five beats, starting with her middle finger. She did it several more times, then opened her eyes and turned toward the building. What had that been about? Keeping my distance, I followed Megan inside the building. She stopped to speak with Headmaster Hook. The whole time, she remained braced as if she was ready to bolt for the nearest door. It was curious. More than curious. And her hand started up that same pattern against her thigh. I trailed Megan and Hook through the main building, then out to the grounds. The headmaster was aware of why I was pretending to attend Academy as a grad student. That was my cover, though I was a few years older than most of the students here for their final year. Hook had offered to have me simply be Megan's mentor but she wasn't supposed to know she had a bodyguard. Why, I hadn't the slightest idea. But my orders from Adam Pierce were simple. Keep a close watch on Megan Wright from a distance. Protect her if the need arose. Otherwise, I was to remain invisible to her. It was fine by me, honestly, and considering how heavily guarded Academy was already, this really should be like a short vacation for me. Not that I planned to slack in my duties. I stayed with Hook and Megan while he showed her to a dorm room two floors below where my apartment resided. She dropped off her bag, then left with him again. They returned to the main building and his office, where a woman with a bright smile wearing various shades of pink was waiting for them. That was Nyala, Megan's mentor. I'd been given a copy of her file, seeing as she would be close to Megan all semester. She was friends with Briar Morris. I wasn't worried a thread of any kind would be coming from her. The three ducked inside Hook's office, and I sighed. I hated the waiting game. Finding an empty stone window seat down the hall and keeping the door in sight, I pulled out my cell to check in with the lead Talon who was on campus. Nick Pierce, the younger brother of Adam, was around this week. I'd met him and his twin brother Luke before. 
I'd only been a year behind them at Academy. It was strange being back here. This time I didn't have to pay attention to my classes. I merely had to act. I called Nick and waited for him to answer. Cody, he said brightly. How's the first day going? Boring. Absolutely and incredibly boring. Good. I hadn't expected it to be anything else. Any trouble with her parents yet? I peered down at the corridor through the throng of students. There was no sign of Megan emerging from Hook's office yet. None. It's been quiet. What were they so worried about? I asked. Was there a threat against them or something? I hadn't heard of one, which is why I remained unsure of the reasons for Megan requiring a bodyguard. Several other students here were the kids of council members, but I was the only extra bodyguard on campus. None that we've been made aware of. If that changes, I'll update you. Keep me posted if anything changes with Megan. Not that I expect it to. I'll be around until the end of the week. Then I'll be switching out with Hunter. You've met him, yeah? Yeah, I have. Good guy. Just got married, right? About a week ago, lucky asshole. Someone called to Nick in the background. I'm needed elsewhere. Talk to you soon. We hung up, but I kept my phone in my hand to make it appear as if I was scrolling through some feed or other on the screen. It bothered me that Megan's parents would go through so much trouble to ensure she had extra eyes on her at an already heavily guarded academy. There had to be a reason aside from their being paranoid. If they were worried about her safety, I'd be able to function better as her guard if I knew why. Eventually, Nyala and Megan exited Hook's office. Nyala waved to her. Megan turned and quickly walked in the opposite direction. I waited a few beats, keeping her in my sights, then got up and followed. She kept her head down, and her left hand tapped madly away at her thigh. At the dorms, right before she ducked inside the entrance, I noticed how pale she was. The building was fairly empty at this time of day. It made it harder not to be noticed. I hung back in the doorway leading to her floor. She reached her room, slammed her hand against the door, and stepped inside the second it opened. Casually, I strolled down the hall. When I reached her door, I lifted my hand enough to sense the spell I'd placed there just this morning. It would alert me the second her door opened. The spell was intact. Satisfied, I trudged upstairs to the top floor in the small apartment I shared with another student. Jack was friendly enough, and as it turned out, was engaged to Nyala. Hook had arranged the room placement mostly to give me a little more insight on Megan through Nyala without making it overtly obvious. So far, Jack hadn't spent much time in the apartment. He was usually with Nyala and hers. The solitude was fine with me. I was used to being alone when I wasn't watching someone's back. The apartment was empty, and I retreated to my bedroom. Once inside, I took my time checking over my gear and ensuring the enchanted knives I had tucked under my shirt and out of sight were still good to go. When finished, I took my copy of Megan's class schedule and studied it. She'd start first thing in the morning. She had three lectures before lunch. Then after was her earth-summoning practical. I was curious to see what she was capable of, seeing as Earth was my element too. I spent the rest of the day waiting for Megan to leave her room. Only she never did. Not even to grab food in the dining hall. Worried the spell on the door had failed, I went to grab a bite myself, then double-checked on her door. The spell remained, strong as ever. What are you doing? I mused softly to myself after I'd reached the stairwell and turned back to look. Maybe she was just tired trying to shake the nagging in my gut that this was a bad sign. I retreated to my apartment, empty still, and turned in for the night. Morning, Rumi, Jack said, sitting down beside me in the dining hall. Morning. I barely glanced his way, too focused on Megan sitting by herself at the far end of the room. She'd been nursing a cup of coffee since six. I was used to getting up at half past five as part of the job. When the spell had alerted me to her leaving, I'd been surprised and had hustled to catch up to her. She'd come straight here, grabbed a cup of coffee, and sat down. She'd barely taken a few bites of the toast in front of her. She'd been so pale, too, and shaky. For the past week, I'd done little more than observe Megan. With no active threats, I had ample time to do so. She was nothing like the others I'd guarded. She was quiet and kept to herself. So far, Nyala was the only person I'd seen her speak with, and that was only if her mentor initiated the conversation. I'd overheard Nyala talking to Jack two nights ago. She was worried about how withdrawn Megan was. She'd been saying how she'd reminded her of Briar, only she'd been pissed off all the time. 
Megan just seems sad, Niella had said while I'd listened from my bedroom doorway. I'm worried she's depressed, but I can't get her to open up to me. About anything. Didn't you say this is her first year as a student? She's probably not used to being around so many people. It took me a while to adjust too, remember? Jack had replied. Just don't push her too hard. When she wants to talk, she will. Well, what if that's never? Niella had asked worriedly. You should see her when she's in her practical lessons. She's almost skittish. It's weird. I had to agree with Niella. During all of Megan's lessons out on the grounds, she'd stayed at the rear of the group. Each time she'd attempted to use her magic, nothing happened. I had assumed it was nerves about her first day and her starting the semester late. But the same thing happened the next day and the next. Worse, any time anyone else used their summoning near her, she'd flinch and go pale. She'd do that counting thing with her left hand against her thigh. Professor Bolin, the Earth Summoning Instructor, had spoken to her several times. If she said anything back, I hadn't been able to tell. She'd walk away after each lesson, her eyes downcast and her shoulders hunched. What are you thinking about so hard? Jack asked. I blinked and forced myself to look away from Megan. Nothing much. Uh-huh. You know, Niala and I are getting together with a few of our friends in Silent Heist tonight. Why don't you come out with us? I'll pass, but thanks for the invite. Sure, any time. Jack took a sip of his coffee and looked across the hall. You know, you could just go talk to her. Talk to who? The girl you've been checking out on and off all week? Shit, Jack was more observant than I'd given him credit for. I don't know what you're talking about. I have to get to class. I gave him what I hoped passed for a friendly smile, took my mug to the counter, then stepped out of the hall. I couldn't go far, not with Megan still being in there, but she had classes starting soon. I wouldn't have to wait long. While I hung out in an alcove, Nyala wandered into the hall. Not long after, Briar and Zack headed in too. They were laughing about something, and Zack leaned down to kiss her. I shifted on my feet and turned away from the scene. Once upon a time, I thought I'd been in love like that. Then I was given an assignment that took me away for two months. Apparently, two months was too long to expect her to wait. That, and according to her, I'd been too closed off, too cold. I'd come back to find her stuff gone, and a note. That was it. She'd never even given me a chance to reach that point where I was comfortable enough to let her in. All I'd asked for was time, the one thing she hadn't been willing to give me. I'd simply tucked the failed relationship behind me and moved on. The job was all that mattered. Not long after Zack and Briar stepped into the hall, Megan finally came out. She tugged on the long sleeves of her black shirt. Her blue canvas tote bag was on her shoulder. I fell in step behind her. The halls filled with more students making their way down for breakfast or their first classes. Megan flinched away from anyone that was too loud or using their summoning in the corridors. She reached her first class of the day and I lingered in the hall outside. From there I could see her pick the same seat as every morning before, in the back, as far away as she could get from the other students. The more I watched her, the more I wondered if something happened to her to make her so skittish. The file hadn't said anything. I'd even texted Nick to double-check I wasn't missing any details. Doesn't matter, I reminded myself. Your job is to guard her, not get to know her. Knowing her would simply mean distractions. Distractions got people killed. I found a bench, sat down, and patiently waited for Megan to continue through her day, and did everything I could not to wonder about why she acted so afraid all the time, or that she was indeed depressed, as Nyala had mentioned. Or think about the reasons why her magic didn't work. Nope. I didn't think about any of that at all. Chapter 3. Meg. There he was again. For the last two weeks, while I'd struggled to find a way to deal with life at the Academy, surrounded by way too many unfamiliar people, I'd done what I could not to be noticed by anyone. It seemed to work for the most part. Except for that one guy. I'd noticed him the first week I'd been here. I wasn't sure what had made me look across the grounds, but I had. He'd been there, casually leaning against a tree with his hands in his pockets. He'd glanced right over me. But later, when I'd looked back, he'd been watching me. I'd waited to feel uneasy about it. Instead, I'd felt weirdly okay. His gaze had been curious. After that day, 
It was hard for me not to notice him around campus. He was an earth summoner too, though we didn't share a practical lesson, seeing as he was a grad student. He'd usually be hanging around the same time I was out there, working with his magic. Yesterday had been impossible not to admire him from afar. He'd been on his own, out of the way near the stone circle surrounding a patch of dirt. It was one of the many practice areas set up for earth summoners to use. His t-shirt had been stretched taut against his chest and back with every move he'd made. His black hair was cut short, and he had the hint of a tattoo curling up the back of his neck. Unlike so many others I'd watched using earth, he was so calm and focused. His movements ended up being smooth instead of hard. There were no jerky stops or awkward shifts of his hands or feet. He'd close his eyes and simply move. The earth answered him without any hesitation. Towers of rock and earth rose to his palms, then rushed around him in a spiral. Part of me had been beyond impressed, and the other part had been extremely, horribly jealous. What had I done in my practical lessons? Oh yeah, that was right. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The day after I'd watched the mystery guy using his summoning, I'd felt eyes on me, and not the instructors. It had been that guy watching from afar while he sat on a bench with a book in his hands. I hadn't been able to do anything with my magic. Did he think I was a joke? Probably, and not that I blamed him. Maybe I should have randomly selected a different element to study. Now I was out here alone in the same practice circle. The guy was sitting on a different bench, book in hand. I'd felt his gaze on me more than once. Was he judging me? Or did he think I was attractive? My face grew hot. Why had that thought even crossed my mind? Once again, I cursed the life I'd led so far. I'd had no friends, none that stuck around, let alone boyfriends. Why are you even thinking about a boyfriend? Shit, Meg, let's not make life any more complicated. Ignoring the guy, I shook out my hands and told myself it was okay to pull on a little magic to make something happen. A tiny rumble in the ground? That was all I wanted. I could mess around with earth summoning. I'd be okay. No one would suspect anything weird. It was only one element. I could do this. I could handle controlling just one. And yet the second I focused on the magic in my veins, felt it begin to rise to the surface. My body seized. The old scars burned. Sucking in a hiss of air between my teeth, I nearly sank to my knees. But there were too many people around too many eyes on me. Knees wobbly, I managed to stay upright and told myself to breathe. Shutting my eyes, I repeated my mantra mentally and counted to five using my fingers against my thigh. The burning subsided, and my heart rate slowed. Wondering what I was even thinking, I rushed to the edge of the circle to grab my tote bag and head back inside. It was getting late anyway. I should probably eat something at some point, too. I didn't have much of an appetite this morning and only had coffee. I'd been hungry before I'd stepped into the practice circle. Now, though, the thought of food made my stomach twist into knots. I wasn't meant to use my summoning. What if I did, and it got back to my parents? Gods, I'd never hear the end of it. They'd probably dump me somewhere worse. And as annoying as being here was, the place could have been worse. With my luck, if I messed up here, my parents would grant my wish of being alone forever. I doubted I'd like where that would be, though. Tote bag in hand and grumbling about my messed up life, I glanced around, searching for the guy. I couldn't find him. Not sure why I was disappointed. I turned toward the main building and set off to get something I could eat later if my appetite returned. The hall wasn't crowded yet. I'd been doing my best to time the mealtime rushes to avoid as many students as possible. I darted into the hall, snatched up a sandwich and a soda, then retreated. I was almost to the dorm building, and Nyala called out to me. I debated pretending I hadn't heard her, but she was too nice for me to do that to. I spun around and attempted to put a smile on my face. Hey, I was just heading back to my dorm. I was wanting to check in and see how your second week was treating you. Nyala was smiling. She clutched a small stack of books to her chest. Her hair was done up in a bun, and the violet sundress she wore was cute on her, as everything else she wore. A pang of jealousy hit me in the chest. When was the last time I'd worn anything that showed off any hint of skin? 
Megan, are you okay? Hmm, yeah, I mumbled. Sorry, it was just a long day and I'm tired. Still trying to play catch up a bit after missing the first week and all. Yeah, sure. She hesitated, then asked, Why don't you have dinner with me and my friends tonight? We wouldn't mind the company. And you can feel free to vent about anything at all. It's what I'm here for, you know. Or if you need help catching up, I don't mind meeting you later. It's really okay. I assured her as nicely as I could. Nyala and I were the same age. If I were any other witch, we would have been friends. But I was me, and getting involved with anyone would only make everything harder, especially when I wasn't sure if I'd ever be able to have a friend again. I'd never be able to trust her. Not fully. It wouldn't be a very fair relationship. And yet, the thought of taking her up on her offer and not being alone for at least one evening was extremely tempting. I almost changed my mind right then, but it wasn't worth the consequences that decision came with. Anyone I became close to was at risk of learning the truth. The truth got people killed. If you change your mind, you have my number. Just text me, Nyala said, her smile turning from friendly to worried. I will, thanks. I flashed her another smile, then continued to my dorm room. Inside, I set my food and drink on my desk, then slung my toad onto my bed. I sank on the edge of the mattress and held my face in my hands. I hated being here. I hated not being able to use any of my magic. I hated having to lie and pretend to so many people. I curled up in a ball on my bed, dragged the blanket over me, and wished to simply disappear. The weekend passed and I stayed in my room unless I was grabbing food from the dining hall. My nights were being spent taunted by memories of faces I wanted to forget. Monday morning I woke up feeling like shit. I should have skipped my lectures for the day, but that would be a red flag to Nyala. She probably would have shown up at my door to check on me. So I'd dragged myself out of bed, thrown on a sweatshirt and my jeans, and hauled my ass over to the main building. By lunchtime I was gritting my teeth and had my mantra playing on repeat inside my head. I hadn't slept well the night before. My dreams had been filled with screams and the wind howling its fury. I'd woken up drenched in a cold sweat and fighting the blankets. Being here was adding to my stress and making everything worse. I'd had nightmares almost every night since arriving. It was all too much. I almost called my parents. My thumb hovered over their number for a solid minute. I knew better. Interrupting their lives with my issues would only earn me a lecture. That would end with a reminder of how I simply needed to keep my head down. If I pretended like everything was okay, it would be. That was how they lived their lives. Never mind that their daughter had already been on the verge of a meltdown every time I was around new people because of how they'd raised me. Never mind the trauma of what I'd dealt with three years ago was always there just beneath the surface, waiting for a quiet moment to strike, waiting for me to let my guard down. Never mind that I had to face a physical reminder of that day every time I looked in the mirror. No, none of that mattered. My job was to get over it and not make their lives more stressful. I checked my phone back into my tote and headed outside for my practical lesson. It took up most of the afternoon, and just like all the other days, I stayed at the back of the group of Earth Summoners, failing to make anything happen. The other students wandered off, chatting happily together and talking about how their summoning was progressing. Why couldn't I be normal like everyone else here? Why did I have to end up being the freak? That's all I was to everyone here, the strange summoner who had somehow ended up at Academy but had no magic. I glared down at my hands, then snatched up my tote bag and stormed across the grounds toward one of the practicing circles. You're going to make your magic work, I told myself. I carelessly tossed my tote bag to the side, then stomped into the center of the dirt circle. You have magic, and you can use it. Nothing bad will happen. Just stick to earth summoning, and everything will be fine. Focus. It's all about focus. I hated the sliver of fear that was already inching up my spine. I shut my eyes and smothered it the best I could. My magic was messed up for multiple reasons. The main one, though, was my parents. Long before anything terrible happened to me, they told me over and over that I needed to repress what I could do, that it was dangerous for anyone to see me use my summoning. And after years of hearing that as a little girl, 
of being confronted with how much my magic put my life and that of my family at risk, it became harder and harder for me to even use my magic safely or use it at all. I'd shoved it down so deep. Most days, I couldn't even feel it. Then the incident happened, confirming how threatening my power was. But my parents were the ones who dumped me at a damned magical academy. All I wanted was a chance to be normal. You can do this, I told myself. You are a Vilisaris. You are far from weak. You're not going to lose control. You're not going to use any other part of your magic except for earth summoning. Breathe. Just breathe. I shook out my hands, then held them toward the ground, palms down. Out of all the elements, I'd always felt most connected to earth. It was steady and strong, never wavering. That was all I'd ever wanted to feel, like I wasn't simply floating haphazardly through life, waiting for something else to come along and crash into me. I wanted to be grounded and feel solid on my path and in my life. I wanted to stop being afraid. Clearing my mind proved difficult, but I did what I could to ease my thoughts. My heightened emotions were another issue entirely. The calmer my mind was, the more I realized how angry I'd become over these past few weeks, and how bitter and lonely. Nothing about my life had been close to my choice, or fair. I hadn't asked to be born with this gift, and I hated every minute I couldn't simply be me. I wasn't even sure what that meant. While I became lost in a torrent of emotions that I knew were only going to cause me trouble if I couldn't get ahead of them, the ground rumbled. It was only for a second, but I felt it. I knew I did. Readjusting my feet, I shook out my hands again, ready to try a second time. You know, a voice snapped close by, the circle is reserved for those who actually have magic. I opened my eyes, dreading what awaited me on the other side of the stones. I thought her name was Helen, but I hadn't exactly paid much attention. She was in my earth summoning lessons and was one of the top students, and she was a damned first year. Behind her, and quickly spreading out to either side, were the other students she hung out with. The three girls and two guys all wore the same jeering looks on their faces while they stared at me. Do you mind? I asked. What are you even doing here? Helen asked, and the others laughed. You can't even use magic. How did you get here, huh? Did your parents donate some money or something? Maybe they dumped her because they were sick of her being a disappointment. One of the guys chimed in. Right? Aren't you the daughter of council members? One of the other girls asked. They must loathe having a daughter like you. Not about to give in to their taunting, I turned my back and shut my eyes, hoping they'd simply go away. I might not have gone to any school settings, but I'd heard all of this before. I grew up with the kids of other government officials and generals. I even knew kids whose parents were masters. These assholes were going to have to try a lot harder to get to me. Their steps moved through the grass while they kept up their taunts. I focused on my breathing. Or tried to. The ground rumbled, but it wasn't from my doing. I opened my eyes, not surprised to find Helen showing off outside the practice circle. She made the earth conform to her commands, rising in a small tidal wave that rushed around her. She had it grow larger and smaller before breaking into four while she showed off to her friends who were cheering her on. I was more than ready to keep ignoring them until they got bored. Then one of the guys raised his hand into the air. A gust of wind whipped around the circle. One of the others, a fire summoner, added his sparks to the mix. They sent their magic rushing over the stones, creating a barrier between them and me. The ground continued to rumble. The sparks became flames. And I was no longer standing on the grounds of Academy. I was back in that dank, dark warehouse. There were masked people all around me. They had my hands in manacles and kept pushing me from one person to the other laughing at me, taunting me. The manacles were warded and burned my skin. They were going to kill me, they said. Kill me like my parents had killed their friends. They thought I'd been an easy way to get to my parents because I had no magic, because I was nothing. But they'd been wrong. They hadn't killed me. I'd killed them. Every one of them.
I'd killed them and nearly myself. The warehouse vanished, and I was on my knees inside the dirt circle. Helen and her friends were still using their summoning, laughing at me. Power was building inside of me. With it came the harsh burning of my scars. Panic pushed me to my feet. I snatched up my bag and sprinted away from their cackling. Chapter 4. Cody. The moment Megan hit her knees, I rushed forward, ready to chase the other students off. Then she clambered to her feet and sprinted for the trees, glaring at the students who remained near the circle and marking their faces for later. I raced after Megan. It wasn't hard to find her. Her shaky voice reached my ears before I spotted her pacing between two large oaks. Her bag had been dumped on the ground, the contents spilled out on the grass. She was tapping out that count of five on her left thigh and muttering the same phrases over and over. I'm safe. There's no danger. Everything's okay. I just, I just need to breathe. Count to five and breathe. Then she was counting, but she kept tripping over the numbers. She was breathing too damn fast, too. Was she having a panic attack? Gods, and she was so pale, her freckles stood out. Her eyes were wild and filled with fear. What was happening to her? Her voice cracked, and a shuddering whine like a wounded animal came out of her mouth. My feet were moving before I realized what I was doing. Advancing slowly, not wanting to startle her, I stepped closer. She jumped once she spotted me and tripped over her feet, falling into her ass on the leaf-strewn ground. It's okay, I said, keeping my tone soft and light. I'm just here to see if you need help. She swallowed hard and shook her head. You, sh you should go away. I'm fine. If she kept sucking in air like that, she was going to hyperventilate. How about I just help you calm down, okay? I'll sit right here, I said, sitting on the ground a few feet away. Does this happen often? She bobbed her head. Her hands curled into the ground at her sides. Her fingers dug into the dirt like she was struggling to keep herself still. No, that wasn't it. Her connection to the raw earth appeared to be calming her down. It was a slight change, but enough to tell it worked. Or started to. There was a rush of air, whether from the asshole students or simply the wind I couldn't tell. Carefully, I pressed my hand flat to the ground to my right. A thin layer of earth rumbled and rose at my command, creating a cocoon of sorts around Megan and me. It blocked the wind, and that seemed to help settle her even more. Why wasn't this anywhere in her damn file? If she was prone to panic attacks, I should have known about it. Shoving my annoyance aside, I started to take deep, slow breaths. You were counting to five, right? Does that help? She nodded again. How about I count, and you just breathe? I began to count to five slowly, ensuring my breathing remained steady. Each time I reached the end, I started over. By the third round, Megan was tapping out the count on her left thigh with her fingers, her right hand still connecting her to the earth. Her breathing was slowing, too. The fear remained in her eyes, though. I nearly scooted closer, but didn't want to send her back into a panic. I wasn't sure how long we sat there with me counting. At some point, she joined in, her whispering voice hard to hear. But there, all the same. She let out a long, shaky breath, and her tense body relaxed. Better? I asked. Yeah, I... thanks for that, she said, and glanced at the earth wall. There was a flicker of admiration, quickly followed by anger and bitterness. You didn't have to come after me, you know. It's no trouble. I shifted enough so my back was to the trunk of a tree. Megan was calmer, but she made no move to get up and leave the sanctuary of the trees and earthen wall. She picked at the dirt on her palms. Stupid. All of this is so stupid. I don't even know why I'm here. What do you mean? You're an earth summoner, just like me. Not just like you, she uttered harshly. Not like any of them. I know you've watched me out there. I can't do anything. I'm never going to be able to. She froze, then raised her head and stared right at me. I blinked, and she was on her feet, grabbing her things and hastily shoving them into her bag. Sorry, I should go. Thanks for helping me and everything. Just, uh, thanks. Then she turned and took off. I gave her a few seconds head start, then lowered the wall back to the earth and followed the path she'd taken. Keeping my distance, I stayed with her until she was safe back in her dorm room. An avalanche of questions filled my mind. There would be a chance to maybe get some answers in a bit. 
first I had something else I needed to take care of. It wasn't hard to track down the students who'd been harassing Megan. They were out on the grounds still, showing off their summoning and cackling. When one of them started to act like Megan and fake panic run away, the ground beneath me rumbled with my anger. All of them stopped what they were doing and turned toward me. I simply stared at them, watching. Uh, can we help you? The young woman in front asked, scoffing at me. I said nothing, and the ground continued to quake. Yeah, cool, dude. I can do that, too. She threw a look at her friends, and they all burst out laughing. Whatever, man. Why don't you just go away? Megan Wright is off limits to you. Understand? I warned. Or what? Oh, wait, are you her boyfriend or something? Did she tell on us? I walked closer, being sure to keep my face composed. I thought I'd recognized her. Helen Turner. Your mother works under General Bastille, and your father's a historian at the Academy of Ancients Museum, yes? Helen froze and her smile faltered. What did you just say? I glanced over the rest of her little group. I identified several of them from the circles I'd passed through during my time as an undercover bodyguard. I wonder what your parents would all have to say about you acting so horribly at such a prestigious academy. Surely they would be appalled, and Headmaster Hook expects high standards from his students. You can't threaten us, one of the guys snapped, stepping forward. With barely a flick of my hand, the ground rolled beneath him, and he ended up sprawled on his backside. It's not a threat. It's a warning. I suggest you lot focus on your studies from now on. I'll be watching you. And who the hell are you, huh? Helen asked furiously. I'm the Earth Summoner that will knock you all on your asses without having to take a single step. Megan Wright is off limits, I repeated. Don't make me tell you again. Helen cursed me out. I tilted my head, and the earth rose around her in a cage. She stumbled back, trying to use her own summoning to break free, but it was no use. I let the rocks tumble down, and she staggered into her friends. They turned and fled back toward the main building. Nodding to myself for a job well done, I strolled across the grounds and back to my apartment. I wasn't surprised to find it empty. I went straight to my bedroom and shut the door. Meaning to go over Megan's file again, I must have missed something. That panic attack had been brutal, and she said they were common. That was an important fact to leave out of her file. Even if it wasn't in there, someone should have informed me of her condition. I wondered what caused them. She'd been fine one second, then the others had started using their summoning, and she'd freaked. The terror on her face in those seconds right before she took off? I'd seen it before. I'd experienced it myself years ago. My eye twitched but I quickly stifled the memories and the emotions tied to them. The stone wall I'd imagined into being over the years, trapping my feelings, remained intact. It had been the only way to keep my rage from boiling over into my summoning after what I'd seen. After a moment, the twitch in my eye stopped, and I went back to the file in my hands. The door to the apartment opened and closed at one point. I heard Jack and Nyala talking. There was someone else here, too. I thought it was Zack. They only stuck around for a few minutes, then they left again. At least this time, they let me be. I tore through Megan's file over and over, waiting to find that one bit of intel I'd missed. My phone rang and I picked it up off the nightstand. Yeah? Why am I hearing about an earth-summoning grad student threatening several undergrads? Adam asked. Word had reached him faster than I'd anticipated. I have no idea. Cody, you can't go around scaring the shit out of random students. I can when they're harassing my charge. They sent Megan into a panic attack. A hint of anger slipped into my words. I breathed in through my nose and let it out through my mouth. Control. I was in control of my emotions, not the other way around. A panic attack. From the way she acted, she gets them quite frequently. Why wasn't that in her file? I'm not sure. This is the first I've heard of it. I slapped the file closed and tossed it onto the desk. Do you think she's trying to keep it a secret? Or the council members are? I don't know. Either way, you can't go around terrorizing other students at Academy. I glared out the window. I hardly did anything. Point stands. 
You've done well these last few jobs. Don't screw yourself over now, all right? I was nowhere close to the point I'd been back then, and yet a voice in my head said with Megan, there was a chance I'd lose the steadfast control I'd trained myself to have. Look what I'd already done. I'd threatened students, probably scared the piss out of them. Understood, I told Adam, reminding myself the only job that mattered here was keeping Megan alive, and yet I couldn't simply ignore how torn up she'd been. Are you sure there's nothing missing from her file? No past incidents that could explain her reacting that way? What way do you mean? I described to Adam what I'd observed since I started watching over Megan. As I relayed everything, I sensed my control begin to slip once again. It was only for a second, then I reined myself back in. That does seem strange, Adam said. I haven't heard of her being involved in any violent acts with summoning. Though I do know there is a rumor going around that she doesn't even have magic, or what she has is minimal, which in itself seems odd. Her parents are quite strong in their own rights. Her mother is an earth summoner, and I believe her father is heir. From what you say, the rumors might have some merit to it. It wasn't unheard of for a child to be without magic. Every now and then it happened. But if that was true, why would they send Megan to an Academy of Ancients? Why not a normal university where she wouldn't have to be looked down on by other students? Cody? Yeah, I'm here. Whatever you were thinking, stop. Stick to your orders and nothing more. I winced, muttering. That's going to be a little harder now. Care to tell me why? She ran off, and I followed. I was going to let her calm herself down, but she was losing it. You talked to her. Yeah, but she doesn't even know my name and she took off after a few minutes, I assured him. My cover is well intact. See that it stays that way, though if I'm going to be honest, it was probably inevitable you'll wind up meeting her at some point. It might even let you keep a closer eye on her. Is there a reason to worry? I asked, perking up. Someone sent a threatening letter to the council two days ago. It wasn't targeting anyone specific, though. I'll keep you posted if that changes. Luke will be at Academy tonight and through the following week. If you have any trouble, even if it's with students harassing Megan, you tell him about it. He can take care of them. He didn't have to elaborate for me to get the warning in his words. Understood, sir. Good. I'll be in touch. He said, then hung up. I placed my phone back on the nightstand and did several slow laps around my room. I told myself to let it go, that whatever secrets Megan hid were hers to keep. The closer I got to her, the more I'd risk making the situation worse for myself. I took her file, glanced once more at her photograph, and tucked it away in a desk drawer. The following morning I lingered in the stairwell. The spell hadn't alerted me to Megan leaving her room yet, but I'd woken up earlier than normal and had done nothing but stare at the ceiling for an hour until I'd grunted to myself and gotten dressed. I'd waited around a little longer, but was too anxious simply to hang out in my apartment and sip coffee, waiting for Megan to leave her room. So here I was, and had been for the last half hour. I wasn't even sure why I was so antsy this morning. It was just an ordinary Tuesday, and as Adam said, there was no cause for worry that Megan might be in danger. Then why are you standing on the stairs like a stalker? I had no answer for myself, other than I needed to be here. Just when I was ready to try and convince myself again that I was overreacting, Megan's door opened. The silver metal band on my wrist warmed at the same time. She stepped out of her room and headed to the bathroom right across the hall. A few minutes later, she emerged, her hair looking as if she'd simply run her fingers through it. She had on long sleeves, as always, and skinny jeans with short black lace-up boots. I was in the stairwell near the rear of the building, not the one most used to head toward the main doors and outside. As I hoped, she made her way toward that set, and I fell in step behind her, careful to keep my distance. It was still early enough that there weren't many students up and about. It was hard to tell if Megan was stressed or not. Her shoulders were hunched, and her gaze was downcast. It bothered me to see her walking around with some invisible weight on her shoulders. By the time she reached the dining hall, she was fidgety. She'd started counting out that same rhythm on her thigh while she grabbed a muffin and headed to the table in the corner. After she sat down, I was finally able to get a good glimpse of her face. Her forehead was scrunched like she was thinking hard about something. 
She looked worn down while she sat there alone. The muffin she'd grabbed was picked apart piece by piece, but she never took a bite. A crack formed in my wall of control. I entered the dining hall, snagged two cups of coffee, a fresh muffin, and was standing beside her table before I fully realized what I was doing. Slowly, Megan raised her head. Her eyes widened. I was helpless not to notice how the sunlight played across the freckles on her cheeks or brought out the various shades of blonde in her hair. I hadn't even thought of what I was going to say. I shouldn't have even come over here. You looked like you could use some coffee, I said lamely, setting the mug down and sliding it toward her. And a new muffin? I put it down next to the coffee, then awkwardly stood there, not sure what else I should do. Is that so? Megan replied, her brow quirking. I blinked. Then it hit me what I'd just said to her. Shit, sorry, that wasn't meant to be rude. I just noticed you usually get coffee, and this morning you didn't, and... I cut myself off with a cough. Why was I so nervous? I was gonna simply walk away, but when I looked up, Megan was smiling. It was the first time I'd seen her do it that it wasn't fake. Her eyes lit up with it. If I hadn't known her as an earth summoner, I would have sworn she could control fire with the heat that stared back at me from under those shimmering irises. She picked up the coffee and pulled the muffin closer. Thanks. Do you want to sit with me for a while? I hid my shock at her offer. I sat down on the bench across from her, unsure what I was doing. She glanced at the muffin she'd torn apart and her cheeks reddened. Did that muffin look at you funny this morning? Not exactly. She tucked the ruined muffin in a napkin then picked up the one I'd brought her. Yesterday, you didn't have to do that. Do what? Sit with me when I was losing my mind like a psycho? You're not a psycho, I assured her, my voice stern. Her brow rose. And you know a lot of those for comparison's sake, yeah? People have panic attacks, I said with a shrug. I've known several others who deal with them, and they do better if they have someone at their side to talk them through it. Well, thanks for being there. It helped. She hesitated, then held out her hand. Megan. I took her hand in mine and gave it a gentle squeeze. Her palm was warm and cool at the same time. There was an undercurrent there, too, like her magic was humming. Do I get to know your name? She asked while I was still holding her hand. Oh, right. Sorry. Cody. And are you going to tell me why you've been watching me? She asked keeping my hand firmly in hers, and how you know I drink coffee every morning. I am. I'm sorry about that, I mumbled. You seem like an interesting person to get to know, but I'm not good at the socializing thing. I was never sure of how to approach you. She held my hand for a second longer while she scrutinized my face. There was a hint of suspicion there I hadn't noticed yesterday. She released my hand and seemed to be having some internal argument with herself. I'm not either. Good with the social thing, I mean, she finally said. I honestly thought... She trailed off and shook her head. Never mind. Tell me. She shrugged one shoulder, murmuring, I thought you were judging me like everyone else. You know, the fact that you're insanely good at summoning and I can't do shit? I'm not the judging type. I noticed. Silence fell over the table. Where I expected it to be uncomfortable? It was strangely not. A smile danced around Megan's lips again, but she smothered it just as fast. She gave her head a little shake, gathered up the muffin, and picked up the coffee. Thanks for this, but I have to go. She started to walk away, but paused. See you around? Yeah, I told her. I'm sure you will. She started to speak again, but cut herself off and hurried away. Contrary to how I'd assumed this conversation would go, she seemed to have been okay with me though she avoided everyone else. And yet she hadn't stuck around. Her class wasn't for another hour. Why did she take off like that? She'd appeared worried, almost afraid, even. Of what, I hadn't the slightest idea. I should have tried to get answers from her about the panic attacks, but those weren't exactly questions I could blurt out. Let her keep her secrets, I told myself again, standing to follow her. Just let it go. But when I spotted her face only five minutes later, the smile I'd seen had been replaced by the same sad, bitter scowl. Her left hand was continually moving against her thigh. 
It took everything I had not to rush toward her and do what I could to calm her down. What happened to you? I mused aloud and felt another crack appear in the wall around my carefully contained emotions. Chapter 5 Meg After Tuesday's brief conversation with Cody at breakfast, I wasn't able to get him out of my head. He'd already been on my mind after what he'd done for me after my panic attack had hit. The fact that he'd followed me into the trees at all continued to baffle me. How he'd stayed with me until I calmed down was even more so. Being around him was nothing like being around anyone else. It was like somehow he managed to cut through the panic and ground me. During our first interaction, I'd been so comfortable, I'd nearly blurted out why I'd freaked out. I'd stopped myself in time, but it had been too close. Then he came to find me at breakfast the next morning and admitted he'd been watching me, not because he was judging my abilities, but because he thought I was interesting, because he was curious about me. Cody was definitely an interesting mystery I hadn't expected to find at Academy. Yesterday I could tell he had questions about the episode and what had set me off. For some reason, he hadn't asked them. It was odd. Usually people didn't care if it would upset me or not. It was why I'd started wearing clothes that covered all of my scars. It stopped that line of questions, at least. Now, I usually only had to field ones that pertained to my panic attacks or my magic. But he didn't ask you, I mused, wandering the grounds Wednesday afternoon during my free time. He was even aggravated when you called yourself a psycho. I'd looked for him a few times yesterday afternoon and this morning. If he was around, I hadn't spotted him. I walked to a nearby bench and sat down, content to spend the rest of the evening enjoying the warm breeze fluttering through the tree branches overhead. Across the way, Helen and her entourage came around the corner of the dorm building. I braced, expecting them to head straight for me. Helen caught my eye, blanched, and steered her group in the other direction. Weird, I whispered. What's weird? I jumped at Nyala's question. She stood to my right and grimaced in apology. Uh, nothing, really, I answered. You sure about that? She pointed to the other end of the bench. I nodded and she sat down. You know, you look pretty happy about something today. Do I? I asked, confused. Yep, you do. So, she said, leaning in a little closer with a curious gaze. What are you so happy about? Without meaning to, I thought of Cody and how he'd sat with me on the ground in the trees, how he'd created that earthen wall to block the wind that he couldn't have known was threatening to drag me back into memories I'd never be able to forget, or how he'd counted to five with me over and over until I calmed down. And I thought about our impromptu breakfast yesterday morning. My face grew hot, and I cleared my throat. I have no idea. I guess maybe I'm just finally settling in here. I lied. Nyala sat back. Maybe. Is everything else going okay? Your classes and all that? Yeah, it's going great. Hmm, she mused, and I waited for her to push me. Instead, she reached into her bright pink bag and pulled out a piece of paper. Something you might be interested in checking out. It's not until the end of October, so you've still got a little while, but I wanted you to think about it for now. I stared at the paper in my hand. It was a flyer done up in orange, black, and red. Her name was on the page near the bottom with a list of those organizing the event. A Halloween festival? I know, I know, we summoners don't celebrate Halloween. But it's going to be more of a fall festival, with some scares thrown in. This is the first year we're having it. I'm extremely excited. Is that because you're helping put it together? She beamed. You caught me. I have my friends helping, too. She glanced out over the lawns, and her smile fell away into a look of sadness. There was even a hint of anger there that I'd yet to see in Nyala. We thought it was time to start having more reasons to celebrate. She grinned back at me. And more reasons to let loose and have some fun. Maybe you can invite someone to go with you. Like Cody? Shit, no. Why are you thinking about him so much? You know how dangerous it is to get close to anyone. Stop while you're ahead. Nyala said she'd check up with me later in the week and walked away, humming happily to herself. I looked at the flyer again. The party was set for October 31st. We were almost through the second week of September already. That gave me some time to decide whether I wanted to go or not. 
The only parties I'd ever attended had been thrown by the council or the masters. They were horribly boring formal events where all I'd done was sit in a corner somewhere, flanked by guards, while I waited for it to be over. I folded up the flyer and shoved it into my bag. What was the point of going to this festival if I was going to end up being there alone? Unless you ask Cody. Grumbling to myself, I dug around for the history book I was meant to be studying and pulled it out onto my lap. Halfway through reading a page, something told me to look up. Not much further down the pathway, and sitting beneath a large maple with his back to the trunk, was Cody. Had he been there earlier? I could have sworn I'd looked around for him before I'd sat down. He had one leg bent with the other straight out in front of him. There was a book held open in his right hand. The wind played through his short black hair. When a few leaves fell from the branches and landed on him, he brushed them away without once glancing up from the pages. In all the times I'd noticed him, he'd been alone, just like me. He said he wasn't good with social situations. So maybe he's just the type of guy that would understand you, or could if you gave him a chance. You saw what he already did for you. Understanding me means eventually getting close to me, I muttered to the book in my hands, and forced my eyes to look anywhere but at Cody. Getting close ends up in one of two ways. Me being wrong about someone again, or him being put in a dangerous situation because of who I am. It's not worth it. While uncertainty left me antsy, that voice in my head wouldn't shut up. If I was being honest with myself, I was damn tired of being alone all the time. I wanted to be able to spend my free time with someone other than myself. I wanted to be able to accept Niall's invitations to hang out. And I wanted to be not so freaked out about asking Cody to the festival. Then what's your problem? My problem, I argued mentally with my inner voice, is that not only will he eventually ask questions, but what if he sees the scars and reacts like everyone else? I'm not ready to deal with that. I'm not. I can barely deal with them. I pulled my sleeves down more, even though there was nowhere else for them to go. Just as I was getting my focus turned back to my reading, a shadow fell over me. Would you care for some company? Clutching the edges of my book hard, I glanced up. It was like I'd pulled Cody to me with a thought. His eyes, which were so dark brown they were nearly black, steadily held my gaze. There was a hint of a smile on his lips, just like yesterday morning. The book he'd been reading was held in his left hand, his finger between the pages to hold his place. His other hand was casually shoved into the pocket of his jeans. If you want, I replied softly, and glanced at the open bench to my right. He sat down, stretched his long legs out in front of him, crossed them at the ankles, then started to read again. His shoulder brushed against mine. I stiffened for a second, then relaxed. There was no harm in some physical contact, right? I'd shaken his hand yesterday, after all, and nothing terrible happened. This was fine. Everything about this was perfectly fine. I looked down at the open pages before me, doubting I'd be able to focus now that Cody was sitting right next to me. But the minutes passed, and somehow, I made it to the end of the chapter and well into the next one. He shifted beside me, and I glanced up. Though we were inside the mountain, there was still a sunset of sorts. The light was fading as night approached, and Cody was still sitting beside me. He'd stopped reading. His book was closed on his lap. When I glanced up, his eyes were fixed on me. Heat rushed to my cheeks, and I closed the textbook. I guess we should head in, I mumbled. Dinner time and all that. I was too much of a chicken to ask him if he wanted to join me. Not that I was sure why. I'd just sat beside him and read for a couple of hours without any trouble. Strangely enough, it was one of the few times I'd been able to get into my studies without stressing about everyone else around me. Our shoulders were still touching, too. It was comforting. Through the contact, I sensed his magic humming beneath his skin. It was a reassuring sensation, one that made me feel as if it would bolster me up if I needed it to. Was he doing that on purpose, somehow? No other earth summoners I'd been around had made me feel like this. He moved on the bench, and his shoulder pressed a little firmer against mine. There was no way he could know what he was doing for me, could he? Nervously, I fiddled with my tote bag while I shoved my bag into it. Just because he came over and sat down with me didn't mean he'd want to have dinner with me. It couldn't. I'll see you around, I said, avoiding looking him in the eye. 
I stood up and took a step away from the bench. Then his hand closed around my arm. His touch was gentle, and where I'd usually be flinching away at the contact, I almost wished his hand would stay right where it was, but he'd already let me go. I notice you study in the evenings in the library a lot, he said. Would you mind if I joined you? I'm normally down there at about the same time. Was he? I'd never noticed him in the library. The late evenings were when most students turned in for the night. Lately, I'd been taking advantage of it being deserted and had attempted to do my studying there. My room had begun to feel too enclosed. I, yeah, that'd be nice, I replied. Great, I'll be down there tomorrow night. Until then, he said, standing up too, the hint of a smile playing over his face again. See you around, Megan. Meg, I said after he'd started to walk away. He paused and glanced back at me over his shoulder. Meg, then. Good night. Night. I watched him walk down the path, heading toward the main building. What have you gotten yourself into? I scolded myself, decided against bumping into him in the dining hall, and hurried back to my dorm for the night. Chapter 6 Cody I was in trouble. More than trouble, really. I'd intended to go back to keeping my distance from Megan as much as possible. I had. I told myself over and over not to get any closer. To not get involved. Now, it was a week after I'd asked her about studying together in the library. A week of meeting her down here and sitting close together while she read, and I pretended to. That's where I was on my way to now. I'd let her go ahead of me to get herself settled. The corner of the library she'd taken as her retreat was surrounded by tall shelves that blocked the line of sight out into the rest of the space. There was a single, small black iron chandelier hanging over the comfortable sitting area that consisted of two armchairs, a small couch, end tables, and one larger one in the middle for students to spread their work out on. The furniture and the rug beneath it were varying shades of forest green and brown. I felt very at home in this corner, probably because this level of the library was also underground. Behind the stone walls, the earth was there, just waiting for my call. I assumed that was why Megan liked this space, too. The first night I'd joined her, we hadn't spoken much. With her, though, I didn't feel like she expected the silence to be filled with random small talk. She was so unlike the others I'd guarded over the last few years. Simply being around her brought a comfort I hadn't realized I'd been missing or wanting. That day on the bench, merely reading by her side, had been a few of the best hours I'd had in a long time. I'd nearly forgotten my whole point of being at Academy was to guard her. Here, in the library, in the quiet evenings, it was just the same. We'd fallen into a familiar routine, as if we'd done this for years. One of us would end up bringing coffee for the other. Then she'd curl up on one end of the couch, I'd take up a chair, and we'd study for the next few hours until she was too tired to keep her eyes open. A few times she'd dozed off on the couch, a book in her lap, her head resting on her palm. The fact that she was relaxed enough around me to sleep spoke volumes. In fact, how she acted around me was nothing like so many others did. I was used to coming across as cold and making people uneasy. But not Megan. When we talked, it was mostly her asking about what I was studying as a grad student. I would told her I'd planned to follow in my parents' footsteps and join the military. I hadn't planned on mentioning my family. The moment I brought up my parents, a pang of old fear and anger had risen to the surface. Without knowing why, I told her that my dad had died when I was a teenager. I'm so sorry, she'd said and rested her hand on mine. You miss him. I do, I'd replied. My mom took his death hard. She hasn't been the same since. Thankfully, Megan hadn't pushed for any more information about either parent. I would have had to lie. Dad had died, that was true. But he'd been killed in a vicious attack that had broken my mother. Once upon a time, she'd been an incredible earth summoner, as was my dad. My parents had made an unstoppable team. They'd been under General Yeller, one of the highest ranking and most decorated soldiers in the last 50 years. Under him, they'd been in charge of undercover talons, and because of them, many assassination attempts and other violent acts had been thwarted. That was why they'd been targeted. It was why I'd buried my dad and watched my mom break into pieces. What about your parents? I'd asked, needing to get the conversation off me before the wall around my emotions came tumbling down. 
My parents, she'd muttered. I'm sure they wish they'd never had me. Why would you say that? I'd asked, unable to keep the anger out of my voice. All I do is disrupt their perfect lives and make everything worse. She cleared her throat roughly and returned to her textbook. What had she meant? From what I'd been able to gather, she'd done nothing to upset anyone. Each time we talked, I picked up little bits of Megan here and there. It wasn't nearly enough information to help me answer the mountain of questions I still had about her. Though we'd become closer, it didn't feel right to ask her outright what was on my mind. Breaking the fragile connection I'd made with her wasn't worth it. Even more than answers, I wished I could find a way to remove the weight on her shoulders. Some days were better than others for her, but that slump to her shoulders and the bitter sadness in her eyes never fully disappeared. The mystery of who she really was nagged at me every damn day we were together. And every day it became harder not to figure out a way to get the answers I wanted. Wondering if today I'd find a way to ask her why she got panic attacks, I stepped around the last set of shelves. The two coffees I'd brought nearly slipped from my hands. Megan was on the couch, but she was hunched over and breathing fast. Her left hand was tapping against her left thigh, but her movements were jerky. Setting the cups on the table, I slowly went to her, saying her name loud enough that she would hear me. She lurched all the same and raised her head. Her eyes were wild, and she was trying to speak, but the words kept coming out in a jumbled mess. Easy. You're safe. There's no danger, I said softly, reaching for her right hand with my left. I sat on the edge of the coffee table, not breaking eye contact, and began to count to five. Her hand trembled in mine. Eventually, her left was able to keep a steady rhythm with my counting. Unlike the last time, this attack only lasted a minute or so. Once she was able to say the count with me, her breathing was normal, and her gaze was no longer wide and panicked. Sorry, she whispered. Don't be. You can't control this. I don't mind seeing you through these attacks. She hadn't taken her hand from mine yet. It was a pleasant sensation, skin to skin. I glanced down at her clasped hands and bit myself to stop from reacting. Peeking out from the end of her shirt sleeve was a scar. It was deep and jagged, pale lines spiderwebbed away from the much larger one. I averted my gaze before she'd noticed I'd seen it. Do you want to talk about it? I asked, my voice coming out rough. It's stupid, she murmured. I'm not even sure why it set me off. Tell me. She rubbed her forehead and laughed. I was trying to use my summoning. That was it. I tried, and for a second I thought I felt something happening. Then everything just seemed to close in around me. She pulled her hand back, tugged her sleeves down, and stood up abruptly. She paced to the far side of the sitting area with her arms crossed stiffly over her chest. I can't do it, she whispered so quietly I wasn't even sure I was meant to hear the words. If you ever need help with your magic, you can always ask. I wouldn't mind giving you some pointers. You can't help me with it. This is how I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And it's all their fault. All of it is their fault for doing this to me. Whose fault? The stones beneath began to tremble while my mind took off, imagining someone hurting Megan. I told myself to calm down. I had no idea what she was talking about, and yet deep down, I knew whatever secrets she hid, they were dark. That scar came from somewhere. Meg, whose fault? She paled as if realizing what she'd said to me. That attack wore me out. I think I'm just going to go back to my dorm for the night. She gathered up her bag and started for the opening in the bookshelves. When she passed me, I stood up and lightly closed my hand around her wrist. She looked down at where I held her, then stared up into my eyes. There was such a confused rush of emotions in that one look. It was like I'd been punched in the gut. Breathing became difficult, and I almost blurted out every question I had right then and there. She was scared. I desperately wanted to know of what so I could ease her mind. I'm here, I told her, if you ever change your mind. The need that flared to life in her eyes put another crack in my solid wall of containment around my guarded emotions. She nodded. I let her go, and she walked away. I waited a minute, then went after her, keeping my distance as always, while I secretly escorted her back to her room for the night. Once she was safe, I made the slow walk up two floors to my apartment. Jack wasn't in, thankfully, and I paced around the kitchen and living area. The scar on her arm hadn't looked like it was from a blade. 
the way the lines had branched off like that? It had to have come from magic of some kind. If she'd been attacked to that extent, surely it'd be noted in her file. Was that why she kept her arms covered? How bad was the scar? It'd explain the panic attacks, I muttered to the shadows of the apartment. It could almost explain why she wasn't able to summon her magic, too. Almost. What happened to you? I mused once I was back in my room, flipping through her file again. Who did that to you? I ended up on her photograph. The same worry and fear were in her eyes there as they had been this evening. I hadn't noticed it all the other times I looked at this picture, but they were definitely there. I sank onto the edge of my bed and stared at that picture, wishing it would give me some magical insight. All it did was cause a headache. I put the file away and lay on my bed that night, unable to think of anything other than that scar on Megan's arm, and how it matched the ones I had on my back. Unable to sleep, I got up and reached for my phone. The scars on my back had started to prickle the more I'd focused on Megan's. It was late, but there was always someone manning the front desk at the home. I called and waited for someone to pick up. This is Cody Aethers, I told the woman on the other end. Is my mother awake by chance? She's usually one of our night owls. The woman replied, Becca, that was her name. I should have known it the second she picked up. I'd heard it enough times. Let me put you on hold for a moment. I expected to hear the relaxing hold music they played. Instead, another familiar voice came on the line. Cody, is that you? Dr. Jillian, I'm sorry to have called so late. Is everything all right? Her worry came in through her voice. Dr. Jillian had been in charge of my mother's care for the last 14 years. There was a time I'd been under her care, too. If not for her, I wasn't sure what it would have happened to me. She tried for years to get me to find ways to accept and move past what I went through. That invisible wall of control, she'd warned me, wouldn't work forever. When it finally came down, she worried I'd be bombarded by too many memories and emotions I wouldn't be able to handle. I was sure she was right. For now, the wall was intact. I'd worry about it coming down when it did. A moment you know is coming closer, thanks to Megan. Cody, are you there? Yeah, sorry. Something came up today and it brought back some memories. Are the scars bothering you? I rolled my shoulders, wanting to ease the prickling. No more than usual. What have I told you about lying to me? She scolded. Listen, I know you're on the job right now, but when you have a chance, I think it'd be good for you to come in. It's been a long time since we've had a face-to-face. I'm doing all right, really. Be honest with me. Did you really call to speak to your mother? Or were you hoping I'd be around instead? She asked softly. You and I both know your mother doesn't talk on the phone. I wanted to see how she was doing, that's all. She's doing well, Dr. Jillian replied. She's speaking a little more these days. She misses you. Does she remember I'm no longer a teenager? Sometimes. If you were able to see her more, it'd help you both. Seeing Mom brought up the past, I'd done a damn good job of keeping buried. Maybe soon, I said, knowing it was a lie. If she's doing well, that's all I care about. It's late. I should go. You don't always have to pretend you're calling to check on your mom, Dr. Jillian reminded me. I'm here for you, too. Take care of yourself, Cody, for her sake and yours. You're the only family she has. I know. Good night, Dr. Jillian. I hung up before she could try to convince me to come in and see her. I was required to every six months. I wasn't sure I could handle any more than that. She was a good person. She wanted me to get better. But getting better meant confronting the past. It meant letting go of the control I'd fought so hard to get. I set my phone aside, lay on my stomach so as not to agitate my back, and waited for sleep I knew wouldn't come tonight. The next day was rough. I'd slept maybe an hour. My mind had been too overrun with not only what Megan had let slip out, but with fighting against the tide of memories crashing against the invisible wall inside my mind. Taking the day off to hide in my room wasn't an option. I got my ass up and dressed and made it to the dining hall right behind Megan. After yesterday, I planned to keep my distance. When evening rolled around, I half expected her to head back to her room. Instead, she'd gone to the library. Cursing, I booked it down to our spot first, 
to make it appear as if I was settling in for my typical evening of studying. I'd just opened a random book I'd snagged off the shelf, and then Megan was there, two cups of coffee in hand. Hey. I glanced up at her, and my greeting died on my lips. For the first time, there wasn't that bitterness in her eyes. There was something close to happiness. Cody, are you okay? She asked, holding out one of the coffees for me. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for this. You looked like you needed it today, she winked after she said it. I saw you a couple times around campus. Didn't sleep last night? Something like that. I was off my game today. I hadn't even noticed her looking my way earlier. She walked around the coffee table. I waited for her to take up one of the armchairs like she usually did if I was already on the couch. But she sat down beside me, put her bag on the table, and pulled out her books. She put her feet up on the coffee table, and with a book and a pad of paper in her lap, went about her work. I failed to read the book I'd picked out. Every now and then, I turned a page to make it look like I was doing more than watching her out of the corner of my eye. Between last night and tonight, something had changed. What was it? Had it simply been what I'd said to her before she'd walked away? While I worked to untangle this new mystery, Megan shifted on the couch. Our shoulders ended up touching, sending a flicker of warmth through me, as well as a hum of magic. Did she realize she'd done that? And the heat, why was there heat if she was an earth summoner? You're losing it. See, this is why you don't get involved. Now your mind is all over the place, man. Keep it together. The remainder of the evening passed by with my mind racing and our shoulders touching, then our hands resting right beside each other on the couch cushions. I was so caught up in the relaxing environment that surrounded us, I almost draped my arm over her shoulders. She yawned and stretched her arms over her head. I'm beat. I think I'm going to call it a night. Yeah, sounds good. I closed the book I hadn't read and left it on the coffee table while she packed up her things. We stood at the same time, and the question was out of my mouth before I could stop it. Do you want me to walk you back to your room? If you want, she replied. I wouldn't mind. We left the secluded corner of the library and slowly made our way to the first floor and out the doors to the corridor. There were very few students up and about this late, leaving the halls empty. Neither of us said anything while we walked, but just like with all the other times we'd spent together, it was far from awkward. Her floor dorms were a little busy, with students still gathered in the hall, talking and laughing together while they made plans for the upcoming weekend. Megan's left hand twitched against her thigh, but she didn't start counting. This is me, she said, stopping at her door. Her cheeks turned red, highlighting her freckles even more. I wasn't sure what she was thinking. Then she was on her toes and pressing her lips to my cheek. Stunned and confused, all I could do was look at her. That's a thank you for not asking me questions. About what? I managed to get out past the lump that formed in my throat. Yesterday. I know you saw the scars, she whispered. And you didn't bug me about them, so thanks. And for offering to be around if I changed my mind about the magic thing or the talking thing. It means a lot to me. One of these days I might take you up on that. It just might take a while. She offered me a rare smile, then turned toward her door. I slipped my arm around her waist and pulled her back around to face me. I'm patient, I murmured, staring deeply into her eyes. Very patient. I can wait as long as you need me to. Yeah? She asked, her voice breathy. That's... That's good to hear. I hesitated for only a moment, waiting to see if I was going too far, but the flicker of excitement that appeared in her eyes was all the answer I needed. I closed the tiny bit of space between us until we were right against one another. I lowered my head, fully intending to kiss her. Then the corridor was plunged into darkness, and someone screamed. Chapter 7 Meg One second I was holding my breath, watching Cody lean down as if he was going to kiss me. The next everything went dark. Cody's arm that was around my waist tensed. In a blink, I had my back to the door, and he was standing protectively in front of me. From the way his arm was angled, it was like he was making ready to put himself between me and whatever threat was about to come our way. The other students were calling out to each other. There was a thud, then a curse, followed by nervous laughter. Behind me, the stone walls rumbled. Was Cody doing that? 
I sensed him moving, though his one arm stayed around me enough to keep me behind him. A fire summoner pulled on their magic. Flickers of red and orange flames burst to life at the other end of the corridor. The orbs of fire launched up toward the ceiling, relighting the chandeliers. All right, which one of you troublemakers is messing with the fires? I glanced around Cody's body to find the source of that angry voice. Striding down the corridor was the fire summoning instructor I'd seen out on the lawns. After being here a few weeks, I'd learned her name was Briar Morris. From the stories the students told about her, she was not someone you messed with. The guy standing next to her was Zack, her husband and another instructor. At the sight of them, Corey appeared to tense even more. His left hand fell back to his side. Had he been holding something? It was almost like he'd tucked something away first. Or maybe I was seeing things. No one's gonna fess up? Briar called out. Fine. When I find out who did it, you're gonna be running the hardest obstacle course I can come up with. Students scrambled to get to their rooms, while others hurried toward the stairs to reach their respective floors. Briar glanced at Zack, winked, then they walked all the way down the corridor to the rear set of stairs. Only when they were gone did Cody relax a little and turn to face me. Well, that was a fun way to end the day, I mused. Yeah, fun, Corey murmured. Are you all right? I'd hoped he was going to put his arm back around me. I was dying to pick up where we left off. But from the way he kept looking away from me and down the hall, I sensed our moment had been ruined. Everything's fine, he said, which seemed like an odd reply. I'll see you tomorrow. Night, Meg. Night, Cody, I said, doing my best to hide my disappointment. Just as I was going to slip into my room, his hand found mine. He didn't pull me back into his arms, but he gave it a squeeze. That was enough for now, I supposed. I entered my room, noting he didn't take a step away until I was closing the door. With my back to it, I chucked my tote bag on my bed and couldn't stop the mad giggle from bubbling up. I'd kissed Cody. It had only been on the cheek, but I'd kissed him. And he hadn't seemed upset by it. If only the lights hadn't gone out, I muttered angrily. The way he'd wrapped his arm around my waist and pulled me to him. Gods, that was insanely romantic. I'd already had butterflies in my stomach, but that move right there was like from a dream. His lips had been so close to mine. So damn close. Moving further into my room, I wondered about how he'd reacted after the corridor had gone dark. He'd moved so fast to protect me. But to protect me from what? Or you're just being weird and he was simply turning around to see what was going on. And making himself a human shield in the process? He hadn't been laughing like the other students. The stones had been rumbling around us, shaking with his magic. He'd been ready for an attack. The more I thought about it, though, the more ridiculous it sounded. Cody struck me as someone who didn't like to be startled. That was probably all it was. He was training to be a talon. Reacting like that to a potential threat was probably instinct for him. I eventually made it to bed and lay there for a while, staring up at the ceiling in the dark. Cody was turning out to be an interesting person. Maybe too interesting. I was going to have to start being careful around him. A few times now I'd been close to blurting out truths about my life I wasn't supposed to share with anyone. Like why my magic was messed up. I ran my fingers over the scars on my right arm. He was the first person I'd met who hadn't freaked out at the sight of them or made them a big deal. In fact, the moment his eyes had landed on them, I was fairly certain a strange look of understanding passed through his eyes. Understanding and sympathy, not pity. Who are you, Cody? I whispered to the night. Who are you? The whole day passed without me spotting Cody once. It was strange. We didn't usually spend time together during the day, but I'd always catch sight of him on the grounds at least once or in the dining hall. But it was like he'd just vanished. When evening rolled around, I wasn't sure if I should even bother going to the library to study. I couldn't stop worrying that maybe the kiss on the cheek had scared him off. But he was going to kiss me back. I knew he was. Or maybe he'd simply been caught up in the moment and decided it wasn't a good idea in the light of day. Whatever, I muttered to myself once I'd reached the corner sitting area in the library. It's probably for the best. We are starting to get too close anyway. You know how much trouble that would have stirred up. I spread out my books on the table, 
unsure which reading I should try to knock out first. History always bored me, but government wasn't much better. Magical theory was more interesting, but so tedious, and it tended to make me angry, seeing as I had so many troubles making mine manifest without causing complications. Grumbling to myself, I picked up the Summoner history book first, figuring I'd get through as much as I could before I became too tired. Footsteps approached the sitting area. Glancing up from my book, a small burst of excitement warmed me at who approached. Cody had a book in his hand, like always. He didn't smile, but that was pretty normal for him. Hey, I said, putting my book aside. I was worried about you. You were? He asked, his brow furrowing. I didn't see you around at all today. He tilted his head, his dark brown eyes lightened. I'd noticed it happened whenever he was happy to hear something. You pay that much attention to me, huh? Hard not to. I inwardly cringed at the admission. Same, he replied softly. With you, I mean. His cheeks reddened, and he ducked his head. He came over to the couch and sat down beside me. He started reading, and I tried to do the same, but he was so stiff beside me. Every few seconds he'd grumble under his breath, too. Something was bugging him, and sitting down here in the library wasn't doing anything to relax him. He kept fidgeting, too, as if his back was bothering him. Closing my book again, I tucked my stuff back in my tote, stood up, and offered Cody my hand. What are you doing? he asked. It's a nice evening, and you look like you could use a walk. I kept holding up my hand, hoping he wasn't going to get frustrated with me. Finally, he closed his book, left it on the table, and slipped his hand into mine long enough for me to pull him to his feet. I let him go, then led the way out of the library. Once outside, I picked a path that led to the perimeter of the grounds. It passed through the gardens and the forest that surrounded the edges of the campus, backing up to the inside of the mountain walls. The best part? There were hardly any students who used it. Cody walked along beside me. He seemed a little better, though he kept looking around, studying our surroundings. It was strange, almost like he expected something to jump out of the bushes at us. I used to take walks like this all the time, I said, reaching up to touch the leaves that hung over the path. Anywhere my parents dragged me, the first thing I did was find somewhere I could walk, somewhere away from everyone else. I just wanted the quiet, and not to have so many eyes on me all the time. We walked further. The wind rustled through the leaves. It sounded like rain. I paused, shutting my eyes and listening to that sound. That noise had always soothed me. When I opened my eyes, Cody stood right in front of me. His irises were so light right then while he stared at me. Raising his hand, he pulled away a few stray leaves that had fallen into my hair. His fingers ran through the strands a few more times, as if he didn't want to stop. He fiddled with a lock of it for a moment before letting it fall to my shoulder. My heart felt like it was about to pound out of my chest. His eyes flicked to my lips for a second, then back to my face. He stepped to the side and turned to face the path ahead of us. We started to walk again, and his hand reached for mine. He held it and didn't let go. Our shoulders brushed now and again while we continued our stroll. Not once did his hand loosen its hold. He even rubbed his thumb over the back of my hand. Cody might not say much, but he didn't have to. His actions spoke loud enough for him. I reminded myself of all the reasons this was going to end up being a bad idea and by the time we headed back to the dorm, our hands still clasped together, I decided I no longer cared if this was a smart decision or not. I wanted to try being with someone, especially when that someone was Cody, and I was too curious about him to let whatever this was between us go. Near the doors, he gently pulled me to a stop. Would you, um, would you want to go get a late-night cup of coffee with me in the dining hall? Or something else? Sure, that's fine with me. It was still early, anyway. We'd usually be down in the library for another couple of hours. We changed course and walked hand in hand to the main building. There were still a decent number of students out and about. I waited for the walls to feel like they were closing in. With Cody holding my hand, the panic I was so used to experiencing, even in a small crowd like this, wasn't there. Huh, I mused. What? He gave my hand a little squeeze. Somehow it was like he knew what I was thinking without my having to answer. You, I replied, and his brow arched. It's nothing, never mind. 
We continued down the hall and turned right to enter one of the arched doorways leading to the dining hall, the quiet chatter of the students already there barely registered. I was too focused on the guy holding my hand. His touch was steady and strong. We made our way across the room toward the hot beverage bar. While we waited for our drinks to be made, hot chocolates for both of us, Cody stood with his back to the far wall. He was framed by the soft glow of the flickering candlelight. I'd always thought he was handsome, but something about that moment made his attractive features stand out even more. My fingers tingled, wanting to reach out and touch the firm line of his jaw and his cheekbones. It was silly, really, but I couldn't get enough of them. Then there was the tip of the tattoo on the back of his neck. I kept wondering what it was a part of. Maybe a wing of some kind? I had so many questions when it came to him. All in good time. What was that? Cody asked. My face burned while I fumbled over my words. Oh, and nothing, sorry, I was just thinking aloud. His eyes flicked to my cheeks. When his lips curled at the corners, I almost couldn't breathe. I wondered if now would be a good time to move closer and see if he'd finished what he'd started yesterday. Something moving over his left shoulder distracted me. I shifted my gaze toward it, and the warmth I'd felt seconds ago turned to ice in my veins. Meg? It wasn't real. It couldn't be real. And yet there it was, thick red streaks of blood running down the stone wall. More were appearing. Crimson seeped between the stones, as if the building itself was alive. There was so much blood, it stained the stones. The stench of it tickled my nose and turned my stomach. Cody said my name again. All I could do was point behind him. He turned, just as the first screams echoed around the dining hall. Cody cursed and reached back to take hold of my hand. Panic erupted around us, drawing whatever professors were close enough to hear the commotion. Bolin was one of them, with Headmaster Hook right behind him. Hook's eyes went wide. He spoke in hushed tones to Bolin. The two men parted, and Bolin was instructing students to leave the hall and return to their dorms. Please, there is no need to panic, he added loudly. This is nothing more than an illusion spell cast by a prankster. That's all. We'll see that it's taken care of. Students rushed out at his words. Cody draped his arm around my shoulders and steered us out with them. I sensed he was trying to stop me from seeing the blood again, but it was pointless. It was gushing down every wall now and splashing onto the floor. If it was an illusion, it was damn powerful. What was that? I asked once we were outside. Probably another prank, as Bolin said, Cody muttered. So much for a relaxing evening. Are you okay? He asked, and his arm fell away from around my shoulders. I missed the contact until his hand found mine again. Yeah, I'm good. His lips thinned like he wasn't sure he believed me. Seeing the walls bleed was creepy, but I'd been in far more terrifying situations. That wasn't even close to enough to scare me. No, just crowds of strangers. Yeah, you're really tough there, Meg. I rolled my eyes at the thought and spotted Cody giving me a curious look. I assured him again that I was all right, and we said nothing else all the way to my door. I intended to let go of Corey's hand, tell him good night, and go into my room. When I started to loosen my grip, his tightened. Cody? He glanced up and down the corridor. With a nod of his head toward the rear stairwell, I followed him that way. We left the busy corridor and walked up another floor to stand on the landing between my floor and where the grad apartments began. Before anything else happens, he whispered and let go of my hand. Moving slowly, as if he was worried he'd scare me away, he held my cheek in his palm. Then his hand slid back into my hair at the same time he leaned down. His lips slanted over mine, and the rest of Academy disappeared. He held me to him with his hand on the back of my head. I fisted my hands in his t-shirt, holding tight while our lips moved together. His other hand eased around my hip, then to my lower back, crushing me to him. I pushed him until his back hit the wall. He smiled against my lips, then deepened the kiss. His arms wound around me, and for the first time in ages, I felt completely, utterly safe. I felt wanted and alive. It was crazy. I hardly knew him, and he knew so little about me. And right then, at that moment, it felt right. 
Footsteps sounded from overhead, quickly approaching. We broke apart and he had hold of my hand again, guiding me back toward my door. When we reached it this time, he leaned in, brushed his lips against my cheek and told me good night. What have you gotten yourself into? I asked myself once I was alone in my room. What the hell are you doing? You've lost your mind. That's what this is. If mom and dad find out about him, you're going to be in such shit. But nothing I said to myself talked myself out of seeing what this was between Cody and me. Not even the string of lectures I'd received from my parents for getting involved with someone they hadn't thoroughly investigated. Screw them. For once in my life, I was going to do what I wanted. I might not have control over my magic or what my real last name was or the blood that ran through my veins. I damn well had control over who I chose to have in my life. Right then, I wanted Cody. I'd worry about the truth when I absolutely had to, and hope he didn't hate me when he found out how much I'd had to lie. Chapter 8 Cody What did you need to talk to us about? Luke asked, standing beside his twin Nick. After what occurred in the dining hall last night, I'd reached out to them asking if they'd take some time to meet me first thing this morning, out near one of the earth training circles. It was out of view of the dorms, and it was damned early, barely after five, so I wasn't worried that Megan was going to suddenly leave her room. The pranks had happened the last two days, I said. I'm assuming you've heard? Yeah, Zach said some student doused all the flames in the dorm building, Nick said with a shrug. It was probably just a joke. And what about making the walls bleed in the dining hall? The two brothers exchanged a glance, then sighed. From what Hook reported, it was an illusion spell, Luke said. Granted, it was damn powerful, and he's not entirely sure how it was pulled off without leaving a magical trace to follow. It was an illusion nonetheless. Nick's eyes narrowed. You're worried this has something to do with Megan? She was there for both incidents. So were a lot of other students, he replied. I started to speak, but he held up his hand. I'm not saying don't keep an eye on the situation. I'm merely pointing out that it could very well just be some student deciding to be an asshole. Megan doesn't need you jump into conclusions. I get dousing the lights for the hell of it, but why the blood on the walls? That's not entertaining or funny. That's morbid. Whoever did it was trying to scare people. Luke tilted his head as if in agreement with me, but Nick remained looking skeptical. If we have a few talents at HQ that aren't busy with other missions, I'll send for them and have them give Academy a thorough once-over. Quietly. The last thing we need is to make students worry that there's another necromancer-level threat happening. That's all I ask. And you're sure there's nothing else you need to tell us? Luke asked me. Shit. There's no way they could know I kissed Megan last night, right? I made damn sure there was no one around to see us. What I'd meant to be a simple kiss had quickly turned into so much more. I wasn't entirely sure what had passed between us. Deep down, I knew it was a bad idea to let myself get close to her like this. But the thought of trying to keep my distance now caused my gut to clench. Cody? Luke pushed. Nothing, I told him, ensuring my face remained composed. I merely wanted to keep you informed of the potentially developing situation. I waited for them to call me out on my shit. Before they could, the bracelet on my wrist warmed. Megan's up early. I need to get back inside. We'll let you know if the Talons find anything, Nick said. If you see anything else, let us know. Hunter will be around too, but I'm sure it's nothing we need to worry about. I nodded, turned on my heel, and hurried back to the dorms. I wanted nothing more than to believe him. There'd been pranks when I was a student here, but they'd had a different feel to them. I doubted any of the other students noticed the slight chill in the air right after both pranks occurred, and it still bothered me that Megan happened to be there for both. Had they been an attempt to trigger a panic attack? If that was the case, I was going to find the asshole myself and ensure he understood what it meant to be afraid. And there you go again. You can't lose it like this. Keep it together or General Pierce will pull you off this mission. I did what I could to wrap another layer of invisible wall around my emotions. After the kiss I'd shared with Megan last night, there wasn't a chance in hell they'd last. An entire week passed after the incident in the dining hall, and though I loathed to admit it, 
I was starting to believe Nick and Luke might have been right about my overreacting. Campus had been quiet. Whoever was behind the pranks hadn't been caught, but as each day passed with nothing else happening, most of the students stopped talking about them. I tried to let it go too, but it seemed strange that no one had been held accountable for them yet. The Talons had quietly swept the campus, as well as Hook and the other professors. Nothing had been found that made any of them believe the students were in danger. The rest of the student population wasn't my concern, though. Only Megan was. For more than one reason. I smothered the annoying grunt rising up and flipped another page in the book I was pretending to read. I was out on the grounds, observing Megan during her afternoon earth-summoning practical. She'd appeared distracted all day, but what about I had no idea. I hadn't spoken to her yet. I'd been too busy once again trying to talk myself into finding a way to put some space between us. It'd be better for both our sakes. But every time I thought about it, I remembered our kiss in the stairwell. Then last night, well, we hadn't exactly spent our time in that secluded corner of the library studying. I wasn't entirely sure which one of us started it, but I remembered how it ended up. Megan sprawled atop me on the couch while we exchanged leisurely kisses that hardly let me get any sleep last night. I thought I'd messed up last night, though. During our impromptu making out, my hands had started to glide up her back, under her shirt. My fingers had barely brushed bare skin. Then she'd been sitting up with a slightly panicked look. I started to apologize, but she placed her fingers over my mouth and told me it wasn't that. She hadn't said anything after but her eyes had darted to her arm, the same arm I'd seen scars on. She'd let her hand fall away, kissed me one more time, then went back to studying for a little while longer. Scars on her arm and her back. That had kept me awake more than remembering how it had felt to hold her in my arms as I had. In my last relationship, I couldn't remember a moment like the one I'd shared with Megan last night. It was refreshing to be with someone who didn't expect me to talk all the time or spill my heart and soul to her after so little time together. I sensed we didn't need to fill up that silence. It was comfortable. And each day I spent with her, she relaxed a little more. That weight I'd seen on her shoulders appeared to be lessening. Or at least it had until today. The lesson ended and Megan went to grab her tote bag off the bench nearby. There was a slight tremble in her hands. The following second I was on my feet and walking toward her. I reached for her right hand and held it to stop the shaking. I'd learned over these last couple of weeks she preferred her left hand was left alone. Oh, hey, she said, but her voice was softer than usual. What's wrong? It's nothing, she said, turning away from me. Meg, I whispered, gently reaching for her chin to turn her back. What's wrong? She worried at her bottom lip and shifted on her feet. When her left hand started tapping out the familiar rhythm on her thigh, I pulled her into my arms and held her, waiting for her to calm down. A few students nearby glanced at us, but I could have cared less about any of them. After about a minute, Megan murmured she was better. I let my arms fall, but made no move to step back. You didn't leave a note for me on my door this afternoon, did you? She asked. What? No. Damn it. All right, well... Now this is a hundred times creepier. I'd followed Megan inside the dorm building after her morning lectures. I'd stayed in the stairwell out of sight while she'd ducked into her room to change and grab a few more books for this evening. I hadn't noticed anything on her door. She must have grabbed it before I'd had a chance to see it. What kind of note? I asked. She reached into her bag and pulled out a crumpled up piece of paper. I smoothed it out. The paper was nothing special, merely a page torn from an unlined notebook. Written in scrawling handwriting with a terrible slant with a short poem of sorts. It started out talking about her hair in the sunlight, then quickly turned into lines about hearts beating as one and blood flowing through her veins and the way she breathed air into her lungs. The last few details were even worse, and I quickly folded it up and shoved it in my back pocket. Maybe it was meant for someone else, I suggested, hoping I sounded convincing. Yeah, maybe. I wouldn't worry about it. I took her hand and asked her if she was ready to snag some food. The rest of the evening was nothing like how yesterday had gone. She was too out of sorts to really eat anything. And later, once we made it to the library, she spent an hour aimlessly flipping through her books before I told her it was okay to take the night off if she wanted. She ended up sitting beside me on the couch. 
I draped my arm over her shoulders, propped my feet on the table, and with a book open in my lap, proceeded to pretend to read. It wasn't long until Megan fell asleep. I let her get her rest and spent the evening pondering the note. On the outside, I remained my calm, usual self. On the inside, I was fuming. First, the two pranks, and now a mysterious note left on her door. It was too strange for my liking. Far too strange. Around nine, I woke Megan up. Her cheeks reddened while she mumbled apologies about passing out on me. She started to hastily get up, but I caught her around her hips and pulled her over my lap and kissed her. No apologies necessary, I assured her, giving her a tender touch of my lips to hers. She sank into my arms for a hug that wasn't long enough, but for now, it'd have to do. She wasn't as tense as she'd been earlier. By the time I left her at her door, I wasn't worried about her panicking over the note. That was my job, after all. Back in my apartment, I laid the note out on the kitchen island and glared at it. Focusing on the handwriting, I hovered my right hand over the note. The spell to search for any traces left behind was a simple one. One by one, the letters glowed and lifted off the page. They swirled around in a tiny cyclone and dropped back to the paper. If the spell had worked, or if there were any traces to find, the letters would rearrange themselves to spell out a name or a description. All these did was fall into a jumbled mess before sorting themselves back out into the poem. Damn it. Cody? Jack asked, stepping out from the short hallway that led to the bedrooms. Thought you were asleep. Sorry if I woke you up. I wasn't asleep yet. He glanced curiously at the note. What are you working on? Something stupid for a class. I lied. I quickly picked up the note, folded it up, and shoved it into my pocket. I'll see you in the morning. Hey, we're all hanging out this weekend in Silent Heights, he told me. You're more than welcome to come and join us. You can bring Megan along, too, if you want. Nyala wanted me to pass on the invitation. I stopped short at the end of the hall. Megan? Yeah, you know, who you've been spending all your time with. I sighed. Shit. The only reason I'd wanted to be discreet was so word wouldn't get back to Luke and Nick. But if Jack knew, then it wasn't hard to guess they did, too. And yet, General Pierce hadn't pulled me from my bodyguard duty yet. That was interesting and surprising. I'll ask her, I promised Jack, though I was certain I already knew the answer. Night, I said, and retreated to my room before he could ask me any more questions about my relationship with my charge. I'd handed over the strange note to Hunter the morning after Megan had found it. He'd promised to pass it on to the Pierce brothers for me. It bothered me that I hadn't been able to find a trace of any kind on it. A couple of days passed. The weekend came and went without too much excitement. Megan and I spent it on campus. I'd passed along Jack's invitation to her. She'd immediately paled, and I assured her we'd do what we usually did now. Take long walks around the campus and hang out in our corner of the library. Her panic had abated, and I'd spent the entire time searching for anyone that was paying far too much attention to her. There hadn't been anyone obvious, which was good and bad news for me. Monday morning I woke up early after getting a text from Nick saying the note had been analyzed and they too had found nothing on it. They were running with the same theory I'd told Megan, that maybe it had been meant for someone else. I wandered down to Megan's floor before she left her room. I was gonna linger in the stairwell and wait like normal, but there was something attached to her door. It was barely six and no other students were in the corridor yet. Quickly I strode down the hall and bit back a vicious curse at what was clearly waiting for her to see the second she opened her door this morning. The theory was shot to hell at that moment. There wasn't just another creepy love poem. There was a rough sketch of Megan while she was out on the grounds, lying on a blanket under a maple, and sleeping. I'd been sitting right beside her while she'd napped. I'd kept vigilant watch over her the entire time, and I hadn't noticed anyone else doing the same. But her hair and the clothes she wore in the sketch? That was how she'd looked yesterday. Snatching the sketch and the letter, I folded them up and tucked them out of sight. Megan didn't need to know about this. If I had it my way, she never would. Moving fast, unsure of when she'd wake up, I placed my hand on her door. The spell I'd placed there to alert me if her leaving remained. I added another layer to it, so if anyone other than Megan came within inches of the door or physically touched it, I'd know. 
then as quietly as I'd come. I retreated to the stairwell and waited. Chapter 9. Meg. Really, there's nothing wrong with me. Not more than normal, I snapped, pacing around my dorm room. You don't have to worry. It's hard not to when you're acting like this, Cody replied. He stood right inside the door, his shoulder against the wall while he watched me. He'd tried to take my hand earlier, but I was too on edge to let him comfort me right now. So he'd retreated to give me my space, but had warned me in that stern tone of his that he wasn't leaving me alone while I was like this. He didn't even know what had set me off today. I'd done well to hide the reasons from him all week. After I'd found the first note on my door, I thought that was the end of it. Then two days later, one appeared in my tote bag. I had no idea when that could have happened, but it had. There was a two-line poem about my hair and my freckles. What was underneath the poem freaked me out more than the words had. It had been a sketch of me while I'd been reading out on the grounds that morning. The next day, another note showed up in one of my textbooks, right between the pages. This one had been only two lines again. There was another sketch, far rougher, as if the person doing this had been rushed. But it had been of me in one of my lectures. For the last week, I'd found a note every day. Every damn day. The happiness I'd started to let myself feel was slipping out of my grasp. Cody had asked me yesterday if it was because of him that I was acting off. I told him it wasn't. Right now, he was one of the few things keeping me sane. The other was simply the fact that, as of right now, whoever this jackass was, they were only leaving me notes. No one had outright attacked me. Yet, what if they're gearing up for it? The thought was painfully sobering. I tried to tell myself it was probably just some student being an asshole and messing with me. I wondered if it was one of Helen's friends. They'd been leaving me alone in front of everyone else. There was always a chance they thought this would be a better way to torment me. Everything had been going so well. And now, well, now I had no idea what was going to happen. I grumbled a few select curses under my breath, not slowing my pacing for a second. Cody's eyes followed me every moment. He was as tense as I was. If I told him about the notes, I knew what he'd tell me to do. He'd suggest I take them to Headmaster Hook. But all that would do would draw more attention to me, which I didn't want. The second I handed over those notes, Hook would contact my parents. I knew he would. And all I'd get from them was another lecture about how I was causing them to be distracted from their duties, how I'd failed to do as I was told. With my luck, they'd accuse me of making it all up for the sake of attention, as if I was a kid acting out. I caught Cody's glance again, and I came to an abrupt stop in my pacing. What if this stalker person stopped messing with only me? What if they went after Cody next? I couldn't let him get tangled up in whatever disaster this was turning out to be. Maybe this is a sign that you never should have gotten close to him in the first place. Or maybe you're being a coward and using this as an excuse to push him away, I argued with myself. Damn it. Why was this happening to me? Why? I stared right at Cody and whispered, You should go. What? You don't need to spend the whole day watching over me like I'm going to implode. That's not fair to you. In fact, dealing with all my craziness hasn't been fair to you. These words left a physical ache in my gut. The idea of not hanging out with Cody anymore pissed me off. But what had I expected? I wasn't allowed to live a normal life. I wasn't allowed to have friends. I wasn't allowed to get close to anyone. Meg, he said, pushing off the wall and coming toward me. What changed? What's going on with you? It's gonna sound stupid, but this isn't because of you, all right? I just have to deal with something. I'm not going to leave until you give me a straight answer. I can't. Please, just turn around and pretend like none of this ever happened. I can deal with this on my own. He stilled, and I mentally cursed myself for the words that had slipped out. Deal with what on your own? It's nothing. Walk away. It'll make life way easier for you. I'm not going to when you look ready to lose your damn mind, so stop asking me to, he uttered. Do you think I haven't noticed? You're not eating, you're hardly getting any sleep, and you've had a panic attack three times out of the last five days. He came toward me, and this time I let him get close. He let out a relieved breath at that, as if worried I was going to push him away again. 
The concern in his eyes was genuine. It struck me how much he seemed to care for me, almost more than I'd ever seen from my parents these last few years. That look stole away the argument I'd been ready to make for him to leave me alone. Please, Meg, Cody said softly and held my right hand. Tell me what I'm missing here. Part of me said it was better for him to stay in the dark. The other was already pushing for me to reach for the stack of notes and sketches I'd collected this week. I removed them from the top desk drawer and handed them over to Cody. They started showing up in my things, I told him. He let go of my hand to take them and flip through the stack. With each note or sketch he looked at, the more his power hummed over his skin. The stones vibrated with his growing anger. His eyes darkened so much they were black. He set the stack down, and I was in his arms the next second. I hugged him back, pressing my face into his chest. Why didn't you tell me? he demanded. I thought they would stop, but they haven't. I didn't want you worrying. I'm already a lot to deal with, and I know that's not fair to you, and... Stop, he muttered, then pressed his lips to mine so tenderly, I almost couldn't stand it. How was he so good to me? How did he make me feel this damn safe and at ease, even when I should have been freaking out? If I didn't want to be with you, I wouldn't be with you. You can't keep shit like this from me. I wanted to protect you in case this person decided to go after you for being with me. Cursing and shaking his head, he hugged me to him again. I can take care of myself. But these notes... We need to take these to Headmaster Hook. Today. He was right. I knew he was right. But I had no idea how much trouble this would cause for me. And if my parents found out I'd become this close to someone? They were council members now. What if they did something to separate Cody and me? I couldn't do that to him. A few more days, I said and Cody scowled. If it's still happening, we can go to Hook. Why do you want to wait? I don't like to cause trouble. You're not, he argued hotly. This person is. A few days, that's all I'm asking. His head fell back with a grunt. Sunday, he snapped. If there are any more notes before then, I'm going to Hook, with or without you. He would, too. That much was obvious from the glimmer in his eyes. Fine, I replied. He glared at the stack of notes and sketches. Why don't we take a walk? It'll give you a chance to clear your head. A walk would be nice. We hadn't taken one all week. I'd been too busy trying to keep him from seeing me lose it over the notes. I just need to use the bathroom first. We left my room, and he hung out in the corridor while I stepped into the restroom. It appeared to be empty, giving me a few minutes to take care of my business and gather my thoughts. Once I was ready to set out again, I left the stall and went to the sink to wash my hands. Something moving in the mirror caught my eye. I jerked my head up, expecting to see someone behind me. I was alone, but written on the mirror, as if it had been there the whole time, was a message. Fear will make your blood taste all the sweeter. I stumbled away, ready to run out of the bathroom. The lights went out, and I froze. A gust of icy wind rushed through the bathroom, slamming stall doors and rattling the windows in their frames. I strained to hold on to the present, but lost my grip and tumbled down into that abyss of memories. Multiple voices cackled around me, voices I'd heard once before. The sensation of hands clawing at my arms and back and face tore a scream from my throat. And yet, no sound came out. The touches became harder and more vicious. My head was thrown to the side from being backhanded, a second blow threw me into the wall. The weight of manacles on my wrists sent a rush of panic shooting through me. I still had to be in the bathroom. I had to. And yet all I could see was that horrid warehouse. The hands kept touching me, pinching my arms and legs. There was another slap to my face, then another blow that was hard enough to cause blood to leak from my nose. I tasted it on my tongue the second it seeped into my mouth. I curled into a ball as small as I could. Rational thought fought against this living nightmare. I was at Academy. I was in the bathroom. This wasn't really happening. None of this was real. But nothing I said to myself stopped the panic from rising. My power warmed in my gut and began to build within me. Fire sparked at my fingertips, and a rush of air swirled around me. 
The stones began to shake, and the water in the pipes groaned, desperate to come to my silent call. I had to get out of here. I had to stop myself from losing control and hurting anyone again. I had to stop myself from killing anyone else. Using the wall, I dragged myself upright, fighting the lull of the illusion. Putting my head down, I ran straight ahead, knowing the door was right there. I crashed through it and straight into the brightly lit corridor of Academy. Meg? Cody's hands landed on my shoulders, stopping me in my tracks. Easy, easy. Just breathe. I glanced over my shoulder, but the nightmare didn't follow me. I tried to speak, but all that came out was a jumble of words that made no sense. I couldn't slow my breathing, and I was shaking horribly. Megan, Cody said sternly, and softly touched my chin, getting me to look at him. He started to count slowly to five. I should have shoved him away. I should have kept running. But the more I listened to the soothing, firm tone of his voice, the more the dangerous flare of magic inside of me calmed. One of his hands found my right one, and he held it, not faltering in his counting for a moment. Voices murmured around us. I started to look away from Cody's face, realizing belatedly there were other students in the corridor. Don't, Cody said softly, drawing my gaze back to him. It's just you and me. Breathe and count with me. You're safe. There's no danger. I've got you. I tried to tune out everyone else, but it became too difficult. Cody tilted his head. The stone wall morphed, expanding to encompass us. It rose all the way to the ceiling, cutting off the noise. With no eyes on me, I was able to start counting with Cody, tapping out the beats on my thigh. The last of my magic returned to the dark hole inside of me. The strength went out of my legs, and I sagged into Cody's chest. He ran his hands up and down my back, calming me even more. What happened? he asked. The mirror, I told him. There was a message on the mirror. But I could have sworn I was in there alone. I don't understand. Are you okay to deal with everyone? I nodded, and with another tilt of his head, the stones returned to their original place. One of these days I'd have to ask him about his summoning and how he'd become so strong. Any time he used his magic, it appeared to take hardly any effort. More students had gathered around, most looking at Cody and me, confused as hell. A yell of alarm came from the bathroom. He told me to wait by the door, then stepped inside. When he exited, he took hold of my hand and guided me back to my room and told me to grab the stack of notes and sketches. I didn't have to ask why. I knew where we were headed. Hook set the letters down and leaned back in his chair. Ms. Wright, why didn't you come to me sooner? I didn't want to make it a big deal, I replied. Cody stiffened beside me. He'd been standing next to my chair since we stepped foot in Hook's office. I tried to get him to sit, but he hardly said a word after what he saw written on the bathroom mirror. This is, unfortunately, a big deal, Hook replied, giving the letters a disgusted look. His eyes flickered up to Cody, then ended up back on me. This isn't something I want any of my students to have to deal with. I'm sure they don't mean anything by it. Tell that to what just happened in the bathroom, Cody snapped. His eyes had gone from dark brown to straight black after I told him and Hook that I'd been thrown into some sort of illusion in the bathroom, too where I was being attacked. It was only on our way here that I realized the magic had been meant to frighten me into seeing a nightmarish scene. Whoever had cast it probably had no idea it would trigger a panic attack and send me spiraling down a rabbit hole of the worst day of my life. Thankfully, there are several talons on campus this week, Hook told us. I'm going to show these to them and ensure they thoroughly investigate the situation. Whoever is doing this will be caught, Ms. Wright. You have my word. I should call and inform your parents about- No, I cut him off. Just no, please. They don't need to know about any of this. Hook's brow developed a deep furrow. He folded his hands and moved forward in his chair. Ms. Wright, if I was your father, I'd like to know if someone was threatening my daughter. You don't understand, I said softly knowing my parents wouldn't be anywhere near as upset in the way Hook assumed they'd be. Please, they're busy enough as it is, and you're already having the situation looked into, 
There's no reason to get my parents involved. Hook looked anything but happy. For now, I will hold off contacting them. But if this escalates much further, I won't have a choice. He rested his hand atop the notes. We will get to whoever is behind this. You have my word. Thanks, Headmaster Hook. Next time, please come to me sooner, yes? I nodded and stood up from the chair. Mr. Aethers, Hook said, standing up too and looking at Cody, would you mind staying behind a moment? I'd like a quick word with you, since you also have a part in this. I wasn't sure about leaving him alone with Hook, but Cody took my hand, promised he'd be out in a second, and I said I'd wait for him in the corridor. Unsure what else Hook wanted to ask him, I gave the headmaster one last frown, then left them alone. I found a window seat across from Hook's office door and sat down. Hook's words about Cody being part of this whole mess hit me harder than I'd expected them to. He was right, though. It was what I'd said before, too. All of this was becoming too much. Cody was an innocent bystander, about to get dragged into the wave of chaos I caused. And for what? Because he liked me? Was that enough? Glumly, I studied the pattern in the grain of the floor beneath my feet. I never should have let it get this far. Whatever I had with Cody wouldn't last. It might have been fun for a while longer, but eventually I would have to tell him the truth or watch him be hurt by the lies. I knew what I had to do. I just didn't think I was strong enough to do it. Chapter 10 Cody Two days after Megan was confronted with that sickening message on the bathroom mirror, everything changed. She went back to being as withdrawn as she'd been her first few days on campus. I didn't bother trying to hide how much I was keeping an eye on her now. Hook had asked me if I'd noticed anything at all. I'd vented my frustrations to him that day in his office. Whoever this asshole was kept finding ways around the magic safeguards I had in place. And though I knew the Talons at Academy were indeed looking into the matter, their lack of finding any solid leads left me warring between furious and frustrated emotions that I did my best to hide from Megan. Cody, she said while I walked her back toward her dorm that evening, I think we need to stop doing this. Doing what? I asked, playing dumb. This, whatever this is between us. I know you said you can take care of yourself, but I don't want anything happening to you. I wondered when you'd get around to it, I grumbled, climbing the stairs to her floor. Around to what? Trying to break up with me because you think you need to protect me? Breaking up with you, she repeated, and her hand, held securely in mine, trembled. That would imply we're a couple. I paused on the landing and turned to face her. Are we not? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess we are. Great. In that case, I refuse to break up. Cody, come on. I'm making you miserable. Says who? Not me, I assured her. It would have been so much easier if I could have told her that no matter how hard she tried to push me away, even if we weren't together, I'd still be by her side, watching over her. Somehow, I didn't get the feeling she'd be relieved to know I was placed here by the order of her parents. What if this shit gets worse, huh? Then it'll be a good thing you have someone close by. She tried to tug her hand free. I held on, wrapped my arm around her waist, and backed her into the nearest wall. Her breath hitched, and her eyes lightened. When her cheeks flushed, I couldn't stop the smile that crept across my face. She did that to me, making me feel emotions I told myself I was better off without. I doubted I'd ever be able to get them back behind that invisible wall of control. She'd created far too many cracks in it for me to repair. This isn't going to end well, she whispered. The sadness in her voice stabbed me right in the heart. Why? Because there's a real psycho on campus stalking you? It's not just that. She looked toward her arm, as if seeing the scar hidden beneath her shirt sleeve. She bounced on her feet, and her left hand fell to her thigh. Meg, I said, stern enough that she looked at me. Whatever happened to you, whatever baggage you think you're carrying around, it will never be too much for me. Never. I want to keep getting to know you. I want to be here with you. And if it takes years for us to reach that point when you're comfortable enough to tell me, then it takes years. I told you. I'm a very patient man. And it means I'll get a lot of reading in. She chuckled. You're insane. Maybe, 
but you're not the only one who has shit in their past they're afraid to let others see. You're not the only one who's scared to let anyone get close. She rested her hands flat against my chest. And what could you possibly have to worry about me seeing under this calm, stoic thing you've got going on? Enough, I replied, and her gaze softened. I expected her to start asking me questions. Only she didn't. I should have known better than to worry she would. So does this mean you'll stop trying to break up with me? For now, I suppose, she teased. That's not a yes, I murmured, leaned in and kissed her. She sighed against my lips and kissed me back. I pressed her into the wall, loving the way our bodies fit together. She clung to my shoulders, then wound her arms around my neck, pulling me into her embrace even deeper. Yes, she finally said. I'll stop trying to break up with you. But Cody, I kissed her again, drawing the moment out like I knew she enjoyed. It was late, though, and I sensed how exhausted she was. Leaving her with one last kiss on her forehead, I stepped back and held out my hand. She took it, and we continued to her dorm. One of these days I'd get up the nerve to confess all she'd done for me since we met. Yeah, maybe that day you can tell her the truth, too. Inwardly, I rolled my eyes. Outwardly, I kept my head on a swivel, ensuring there was no one following us to her room or lying in wait. She unlocked her door, and it swung open. She was still facing me, asking if I wanted to come in for a little while. From the look on her face, she was hoping to continue what I'd started on the landing. I opened my mouth to say yes. Then I spotted the flash of something on the wall over her shoulder. Immediately I grabbed her hand and pulled her back toward me, keeping her head tucked against my shoulder. I started to back out of the room, but she was asking me what was wrong. It's fine, we're just gonna go somewhere else, I said roughly, while the stone walls trembled with my fury. Cody, seriously, what is it? You don't need to see it. Trust me, don't. She slipped under my arm and charged into her room. What the fuck? I rushed in to stand beside her, staring at the wall. Written in red in what I hoped wasn't blood were the words, Remind you of anyone? And nailed to the wall right above it, with its wings outspread, was a dead raven. Megan took a half step forward, then collapsed into my arms. I placed the bag of Megan's belongings at the foot of the bed. Until we figured out who was messing with her, Hook had moved her into the spare room in Niall's apartment two floors up. Megan had no chance to argue, seeing as she'd passed out and hadn't woken up until I'd already carried her upstairs. I don't like this, she complained from where she sat on the bed, her back propped up against the wall. You're not about to stay in your room, I warned her. But putting me with someone else just puts that person in danger. Megan hugged her knees to her chest. She was afraid, but for some reason I got the sense she wasn't only afraid of her stalker. She was afraid of something else. I wanted to ask, but now wasn't the time to push for answers. It's just temporary. She nodded without looking at me. Sighing, I went and sat on the edge of the bed. We're gonna figure this out, okay? We will, and then everything will be fine. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Yeah, and what if something happens to you? All I do is get people hurt. She flinched as if unsure of her own words. She tucked her head and refused to raise it again after I said her name. Megan? Nyala asked from the doorway. I brought some tea to help settle your nerves. Megan grunted in reply. I wanted to pull her into my arms and hold her until she stopped trying to curl into an even tighter ball but I couldn't stick around. The Pierce brothers were waiting for me in Megan's dorm room. I'll be close by if you need me, I promised Megan. I had no time to wait around for her to respond. Standing, I turned for the door, thanked Nyala again for doing this. Then I slipped out of the apartment. Two floors down, I strode quickly through the corridor until I reached Megan's room. The door was open, and three figures stood inside. They turned to me and nodded in unison. Zack was to the right. Then Luke and Nick. Headmaster Hook had come and gone already. I've seen some messed up shit, Luke commented after I joined them. This is almost as bad. Did Megan tell you anything? Nick asked. I asked her, but she said she had no idea what it could mean. I planted my hands on my hips while I glared up at the dead bird and the words that were indeed written in the poor creature's blood. She's lying. Are you sure? I nodded at Zack's question. She was too calm when she replied, far too calm. I walked to the wall and held out my hand toward the bloody letters. Did you pick up any magical traces yet? 
Nothing, unless you're sensing something we couldn't. Nick said, Sadly, I wasn't. The words and the raven gave off nothing at all. No magic, no sensations, nothing. But someone had to have used magic to get inside this room. The alarms I'd set on the door hadn't been triggered. I strained to recall if there'd been a chill in the air after Megan had first opened the door. Those words have to mean something, Luke muttered under his breath. This isn't a creepy love poem. This is a threat. Whoever did this won't stop here. A horrifying image of some unknown figure snatching Megan out of my arms formed in my mind's eye. Whoever was doing this had already proved they could get past my magic. What if they managed to get through me, too? What if they hurt Megan because I missed something? Cody, you might want to calm down before you make the dorms collapse, Luke said and gave my shoulder a squeeze. I unclenched my hands and the walls stopped vibrating. Are you sure there's nothing else you need to tell us? Nick had his arms crossed, studying me with a raised brow. Like, I don't know, how you're involved with your charge? Is there a problem if I am? Nick exchanged a look with Luke, but it was Zach who answered. At some point, you're going to have to tell her the truth. That's not something I'm concerned with at the moment, I told him. All I care about is finding the bastard who's tormenting her. I reached up and pried the dead raven from the wall. There was nothing on it except blood from where it had been stabbed through the heart. Was that what this person wanted to do to Megan? It'll never happen. I'll break him apart first. Luke reached over and removed the raven from my hands. You keep doing what you're doing, he said. We'll keep trying to track down who's behind these attacks. Were there any more threats sent to the council? I asked. None that we've been made aware of. The fluttering sound of paper came from behind us. The paper crane flew into the room and unfurled itself in front of Nick's face. Message from Hook. He needs to speak to me right away. Luke, Zach, finish up here. He nodded toward the door. Cody, get some sleep. I have a feeling you're going to need it. We'll add our own layer of wards to Niala's apartment before we head out. And you'll let me know if you find anything. Nick's lips thinned, but he said they would. With one last disgusted glance at the words on the wall, I stormed out of the room and up to my apartment. It was at the opposite end of the hall from Nyala's. On the bright side, this incident allowed me to remain closer to Megan. On the downside, I now had far too many questions piling up and needed some damn answers or I was going to lose my mind. A voice at the back of my mind said I should call Dr. Jillian and let her know what was happening. If that wall was about to come down, she'd be one of the few people who might be able to get it back up. You're not there yet. You're fine. Keep it together. I found myself counting to five in a whisper, much as I would do for Megan to calm her down. It helped, and soon enough I was back in control. For now. With my bedroom door closed and locked, I went to the box I had stashed in the closet, dragged it out and dumped it on my bed. I hadn't only been given a file on Megan. I'd been allowed access to everything her parents had a hand in during their careers. It had been fairly dull reading the first two times through, but with what was being done to Megan, there had to be something I'd missed, some tiny detail that would explain why she was being tormented. Remind you of anyone? You know what those words meant, I whispered to Megan's photograph, staring at me from her file. Why lie? What are you worried about? And why a raven? I hunched over the stacks of files and started all the way back at the beginning. Sunlight streamed through the window at some point while morning broke over Academy. My back ached, my eyes were crossing, and I was beyond exhausted. But there'd been nothing in the files, nothing to give me a hint of why Megan would be targeted. From what I read, her parents had never been involved in anything that would deem someone taking revenge, and Megan had lived a fairly secluded life. There hadn't been a chance for her to make enemies. This doesn't make sense. I shuffled the files back together ran my hands down my face to wake myself up, and did a slow walk around my room. Dealing with a stalker was one thing. That final message, though, hadn't felt stalkerish. That felt like someone Megan knew, leaving her a warning. I hated to do it, but today might be the day when I had to start asking her the hard questions. Or get one of the Pierce brothers to do it. The door to the apartment opened. I thought I heard Jack talking to someone, then seconds later there was a knock at my door. I wasn't expecting to see you so fast. What did Hook want? 
I asked Nick after I'd unlocked my door and let him in. He glanced over at my bed and the files. Did you get any sleep? No, what's wrong? It's not just Megan. What do you mean? He pulled out the folder that was tucked under his left arm and handed it to me. I've been up with Hook all night. Take a look. Confused, I opened the folder and immediately looked back at him. What are these? Exactly what you think. Turns out the other four students who have parents that are council members have been receiving the same shit as Megan has. Some of them have been getting it since the start of the semester. Why weren't we told about this the other day in Hook's office? The other students were trying to keep it quiet, just like Megan was. One of them heard it from another one about what happened in the bathroom, and another what she found in her room. So last night, after a Hook got back to his office from the dorms, he was greeted by a group of students with the same creepy shit happening to them. I shuffled through the pages. There were sketches of these other students and the same weird short love poems to go with them. Anyone else end up with a dead bird nailed to their wall? Not yet, but three of them did have the same creepy message and illusion shit happen in their private bathrooms. Grad students. Five students are being targeted then. I reached the end of the stack of notes. They all read the same as the ones Megan received, all except that final message on her wall. Did you talk to these students yet? I did. It's where I've been this whole time. They're all on edge. I doubt it's just one student behind all of this. My thoughts, too, Nick said, which is why Luke and I are hoping you can help us set up a trap of some kind for them. Megan won't be used as bait. I hadn't planned on asking. We're going to have five talons use illusions to take on the guise of the five students. For the next three days, we'll set up various points where we'll be able to catch someone in the act of leaving these notes. Megan and the others are going to be requested to stay out of sight during that time. She's safe at Niall's apartment right now. The others will be moved to other locations as well. It was a decent enough plan, but my gut twisted. It sounded too easy. From the way Nick kept grumbling to himself, he thought the same. What are you thinking? I asked. If it is students doing all of this, they have to be using some high-level magic. High enough that they're able to cover their tracks. His eyes narrowed. They might not be students. The professors? No, we've had them all checked out. But you might not be the only student here undercover. We'd have to check every student at Academy. That will take days. We'll go through with the first part of our plan, Nick told me. Have the Talons take the place of the five students being targeted. You'll go back to acting as you've been around Megan, who will now be that fake Megan. We'll do what we can to sift through the student population as efficiently as possible. He already had a cell in his hand and was texting. We'll send for more Talons to arrive quietly. He said he'd meet me in Hook's office in one hour to finalize the plan, then left. Alone again, I aimlessly flipped through the file he'd given me. Why go through all this trouble to terrorize five students, I mused. We were missing something. We had to be. I kept going back to the message on Megan's wall and the dead raven. All I could hope was that this plan worked, and that for once my instincts were off, and that something worse wasn't waiting in the shadows to attack. Chapter 11 Meg I was so sick of being trapped. That's all this was. I was trapped in a cage with no idea how long I'd be here. I'd been introduced to Nick and Luke Pierce the morning after that bird was found nailed to my dorm room wall. They'd explained their crazy plan of how to catch the stalker, who apparently wasn't only targeting me. I should have been relieved. How could I be when that last message was only for me? Every night I dreamed of the dead raven on my wall, except it wasn't dead. It fluttered and shrieked, begging to be let free and I was the one killing it. Spending my days trapped in Niall's apartment was tough. She hovered as much as I could tell she tried not to. I worried I'd been waking her up, screaming from those nightmares. If that was the case, she hadn't said anything about it yet. I sensed it was only a matter of time. Worse was having Cody stop by every morning and evening to check on me. He never stayed long because I found reasons for him to leave. I worried about him being near me too much. Repeatedly, he told me the Talon's plan would work, and I had nothing to be afraid of. 
but he didn't know the truth. He had no idea what that last message meant. How had they found me? Who even were they? As far as I knew, I'd killed everyone in that damn warehouse that night. There should have been no one left alive to come after me. Cody brought up that message a couple of times. Each time I denied having any idea what it might mean. He didn't believe me. I sensed it in the magic flowing through his hand and straight into me. It had hum louder, as if begging me to give him the truth. That one truth would lead to so many more. Finding out I was a Villaceris would open up a whole world of trouble for him. I couldn't do that to him. But I couldn't stay in this damn room any longer either. I needed open space. I needed the grass beneath my feet. The clock read midnight on the nightstand. Quietly I opened the bedroom door and waited. No sound came from the rest of the apartment. I tiptoed to the front door, reached for the handle, then cursed at the magic coming off it. The Pierce brothers hadn't lied when they'd said they'd warded it. What are you doing? Whipping around, I flattened my back to the door and stared. Cody sat on the couch, his short hair a mess as if he'd just woken up. His t-shirt was wrinkled, and he was still in his jeans. He was even still wearing his boots. Why had he gone to sleep fully dressed? Why was he even here? Have you been sleeping here? Shit, had he heard me wake up screaming from nightmares? I wasn't sure if I'd be able to keep lying to his face if he called me out for that. Just tonight, he replied. You seemed more restless than usual. I was worried you were going to do something stupid. Are you insane? Didn't you hear Luke and Nick? I'm a danger. You can't be here. I told you I can take care of myself. That's not the point, I whispered, remembering that Nyala was here and probably sleeping. She's at Jack's apartment tonight since I said I'd stay, Cody told me. You don't have to be quiet. And for the record, if you did happen to get out that door, there are two talons on the other side of it. I sagged against the door, then slid down it until my ass hit the floor. I hate this. I hate everything about this. I just wanted to take a walk. That's it, and I can't even do that. Tears burned in my eyes, and I hated them, too. Cody came over and crouched in front of me. He held out his hand. Come on, then. I glanced from his hand to his face. What? It's the dead of night. If you want to take a walk, we'll take a walk. I'm sure I can convince the talons outside this door to come with us. You should stay behind. I'm either coming with you, or I'm carrying your ass back to your bedroom and locking you in. You wouldn't dare. He leaned in closer, and his eyes narrowed. Try me. He'd do it, too. That wasn't a bluff. Cody might not intimidate me, but he'd certainly be the one to scare others off once he became a Talon. Are you in some sort of early training program or something? What do you mean? You're acting like a damn bodyguard. I'm looking out for someone I care for, he replied, still holding out his hand. Are we walking, or are you going back to bed? I reached for his hand, and he hauled me upright. He opened the door, and we stepped out into the corridor. Two people, a guy and a woman, stepped out of the shadows to the left. Hunter, Trisha, this is Megan. She would like to take a walk on the grounds. Will that be possible? Cody asked. I expected them to say no, but they nodded, falling in step behind us. I was used to that, at least, from my days of being escorted around by multiple guards. Cody's hand slipped into mine and we made our way silently through the dorms and out onto the grounds. Fresh air flooded my lungs the second we were through the doors. I paused, taking in the night. The sensation of being trapped fell away, and I leaned into Cody's side while we picked a path and walked along it. I've missed this, I murmured. Me too. I'm sure we'll be able to get back to it soon. Have they told you anything? Why would they? I don't know, you seem pretty friendly with the Talons on campus. I know as much as you do, he said, but there was an edge to his words. A few steps later, he was cursing under his breath. What? Instead of answering, he glanced over his shoulder toward Hunter and Trisha. The ground rumbled beneath our feet. I hadn't the faintest idea of what was happening. Then the Talons stepped off the path, darting into the trees on either side. Cody's hand tightened its hold on me and he slowed our pace until we were barely strolling. Something was wrong. I glanced up at Cody, but his face was calm and composed. He drew me into his side, then lowered his mouth to my ear. We're not alone out here. Stay right beside me, 
Understand? There was no chance for me to reply. A rush of howling wind barreled down the path as if driven by a cyclone. The ground shook beneath our feet, not from Cody's summoning. The gust nearly knocked me off my feet, but Cody wrapped me in his arms, braced himself, and a wall of earth shot up in front of us, forming a curved wall. The wind crashed into it, but the wall held. Cackling and screaming came next. Shadow figures crawled over the top of the wall. They leered down at us with shining red eyes. Long talons jutted from their hands, and blood gushed from their gaping maws. More crawled on the ground, coming up behind us, down the path. A second wall cut us off from them, but they merely climbed atop it, joining the others. They all started to whisper my name, their voices shrill and cracking like embers. Heat built inside me, bringing with it a tidal wave of sheer panic. An illusion, Cody yelled to me over the winds. Just an illusion. Look at me, Meg. Only me. With effort, I got my eyes to focus on his. The figures came closer and closer. Out of the corner of my eye, their talons reached toward my face. Cody never wavered for a second. I was going to yell a warning. Then he smiled. Without his arms ever moving from my body, the earthen walls he'd created exploded upward and outward, taking the shadow beings with them. There was a yelp of pain, followed by a vicious string of curses. The ground rumbled, and that voice turned into a panicked shout. Dust settled enough for me to see ahead of us. There, trapped in a pillar of rock and dirt, was a man. His face was pinched in pain, while he was held about five feet off the ground. He tugged on his limbs, but his prison held. Cody tilted his head, and the rock constricted. All right, we give, damn it! Don't crush me to death! We? I asked. Two figures emerged from the trees to our right. Hunter shoved a second man to his knees, his hands already trapped behind his back in cuffs. We. Trisha, you got the last one? Oh, I do, she replied, dragging a third man onto the path. He was unconscious, but alive. Were they after me? How did they even know I'd be out here? I asked, while my mind played catch-up to what just happened. I turned to Cody. How did you even know he was there? What the fuck is going on? I snapped. I'm sure we're about to find out, Cody told me. Any bets on whether these are your stalkers? The next few hours passed in a crazy blur. Cody and I had been escorted to Hook's office, where we were told to wait until the three men were officially taken into custody by the Talons. I'd been so busy replaying those moments outside that I hadn't noticed we'd sat there for two hours before Nick and Hook finally joined us to explain what was happening. The three men had been ready to head into the dorms to leave the next round of messages for their targets. They'd spotted Cody and me leaving and decided it'd be more beneficial to try another illusion scare tactic. Apparently, they'd figured out there'd been someone using an illusion to act like me and the other students they'd been after, so when they had a chance to go after the real me, they took it. They hadn't expected their presence to be detected. It had been incredible how fast Cody had picked up on the fact that we weren't alone. He was going to make a damn fine talent after he graduated something Nick was sure to tell him by the end of the conversation. We'll get more information once they're taken back to Talon HQ, Nick told me. From what they've said, it was only the three of them working on campus. They snuck in during the week of orientation. They pretended to be grad students to blend in with everyone else. Did they say why they did it? I asked. Cody reached over and unclenched the right hand I hadn't noticed I'd been holding so tightly. He wound our fingers together. I pulled on his steady strength to get me through the rest of this night. All they've mentioned so far is that they were paid to do it. On the bright side, it's over, Nick assured me. You and the other students can go back to your lives. We'll keep some extra talents on campus just in case, but I wouldn't worry. Why don't you two head to bed? Hook suggested. You've had a long night. I'm cancelling classes for the next two days, too, so there's no need to worry about that. Just like that? I whispered. It's just over? Come on, Cody urged, pulling me to my feet. Do you want to stay in Niall's apartment tonight, or in your room? My room is fine. Hook and Nick told us goodnight, and to get some rest. It wasn't until Cody and I were halfway to the dorms that my knees were shaking too much to keep holding me upright. I should have been freaking out during the whole incident. 
being next to Cody had kept me calm. Now that it was over, the swell of relief was too much for me to handle. They'd caught the bastards. It hadn't been my past catching up to me. The message, the bird? They'd been coincidences. Nothing more. Who wouldn't freak out if they found a dead bird nailed to their wall with a message suggesting they'd be next? Easy, Cody whispered, holding me up. I've got you. Sorry. I can walk, really. Sure you can. He adjusted his arms and scooped me off the sidewalk. But this is easier. You don't have to carry me, I said while I curled into his chest. He was ridiculously comfortable. It wasn't fair. You're the one who had to fight. I barely lifted a finger. It was incredible. You're damn good at earth summoning. Did you know that? He chuckled. I had an inkling. We were quiet for the rest of the walk to my room. At my door, Cody set me on my feet, and I unlocked it. I braced to find another bloody message on the wall. There was nothing but a blank wall. I stepped inside and flipped on the light. I'll let you sleep, Cody said, starting to back away. Wait, would you... Um, would you mind staying for a while? I don't want to be alone right now. I know they're gone and it's over, but... I'll stay, he said, gently cutting off my rambling. I kicked out of my shoes, climbed onto the bed with my back to the wall, and patted the space beside me. Cody removed his shoes, too, and sat down. I leaned into his side, and his arm draped over my shoulders. I snuggled against him, shutting my eyes and fully relaxing. He ran his fingers through my hair, breathing slow and deep. Meg, he asked after a while. Hmm? I replied, so close to drifting off. You know that festival's coming up soon. Do you want to go with me? I tilted my head back and looked up at him. Yeah, I think I would. He returned my grin, kissed my forehead, and drew me closer to his side. Sleep. I'm not going anywhere. I wanted to believe him. I truly did. He wouldn't be the reason this didn't work, though. It'd be me. I hung on to him tighter, shut my eyes, and pretended everything was going to be okay. It worked for my parents. Maybe it'd finally work for me, too. The grounds of Academy had been transformed into something out of a damn movie. There were black and orange streamers hanging from the trees, shimmering with living flames. Paper lanterns in the shapes of spiders and bats hovered over the pathways and in between the booths that had been set up. Jack-o'-lanterns were everywhere, displayed on hay bales and lining the paths. Spirit orbs lit with flames were scattered around, flickering like fireflies. There was even a damn haunted house that had been constructed for tonight. Nyala and the others who'd put on the festival had really outdone themselves. There were game booths and little ones selling magical trinkets. There was more food than I had any hope of trying in one night. The air smelled of mums and crisp apples and caramel. Cinnamon, too. I took another deep breath in and sighed. After how this semester had started out, I'd worried every week was going to add to the nightmare of what coming here had been for me. You look happy, Cody commented. I am. I'm glad you asked me to come with you. Yeah, he said, letting go of my hand and draping his arm over my shoulders instead. Me too. He kissed the top of my head. So, what do you want to do first? I had no idea. We wandered whichever way the evening breeze took us moving from one booth to the next. Cody was smiling pretty much the entire time. It brightened his eyes. Every time he glanced down at me, his smile would change, becoming almost like a secret look just for me. I leaned into him while we strolled down the sidewalk, taking in the sights. Right after I'd stepped out of my room to come here, his hand hadn't let go of mine. I'd never told Cody about my fear around crowds or how his being at my side helped keep the panic at bay. Somehow he seemed to know, or at least have an inkling. Whenever I started to feel overwhelmed, he guided me off to a less crowded part of the grounds. Once I was good to go, we headed back to explore the festival. I was sure he worried I remained uneasy after dealing with those assholes who'd been paid off to stalk members of the council's family. They'd been caught and were no longer here. I had nothing more to worry about. The last few weeks... It was like I'd never had to deal with creepy notes or finding a dead bird nailed to my wall. For the first time in a long time, 
I almost felt normal. The best part? Hook had, unfortunately, contacted the council about the incident. He'd explained what had occurred, and unlike the other students, I'd received no phone calls from my parents. Not a word. Cody had seemed upset at their silence. I'd assured him it was for the best. I could use a drink, he said after we finished walking through the haunted trail in the woods. It had been decorated with skeletons controlled by magic that sprang out at people as they went past. I jumped and screamed a few times. Cody was too damn in control of himself to have been caught off guard. I could use something to warm up. It's a little chilly. Two ciders, then? Yeah. Do you want to do the haunted house next? You're determined to scare me tonight, aren't you? Just one time. That's all I want. He slipped his arm around my waist and brought me up to my toes. Our lips met, and I almost told him to forget the cider and dragged him off to a much quieter part of the grounds. He gave me a peck on my cheek next, set me back down, and said he'd meet me by the haunted house. He started to turn away, but paused. I'll be okay for a few minutes, I promised him, and let go of his hand first. The haunted house wasn't far away. I weaved my way through the crowd until I reached the fence that had been erected around it. A stone path led to the front door. Students were going in the front and exiting through one of the two side doors. It was two stories, and from the look of it, it was going to be a good time. I peered into one of the windows on the main floor, attempting to get an idea of what was inside. A wave of dizziness hit me. One second I stood beside the fence. The next, I was inside a large room with a two-story ceiling. There was a chandelier hanging overhead and nothing but bare walls around me and a wooden floor under my feet. The hell? My stomach churned, and I couldn't stop myself from vomiting. Hitting my knees, I threw my head to the side losing everything I'd just eaten at the festival. Where was I? A door crashed open behind me, followed by another to my right and a third to my left. Swarms of blackbirds rushed into the room, whipping around me and diving in to peck at me with their beaks. Ravens. All of them were ravens. Through the rapidly flapping wings, figures entered the room, wearing black cloaks that trailed on the ground behind them. They formed a circle around me. The one dead ahead raised a hand. They snapped their fingers, and the ravens soared up into the rafters, perching on the beams. Their beady eyes stared down at me, watching, waiting. You poor little thing, a voice said coming from beneath that hood. You poor, sweet, innocent little girl. No, I rasped. You can't be here. Why is that? That voice. Why did I hear that voice? And these people, they had to be an illusion. This wasn't real. It couldn't be real. I was at Academy. This was all some sort of trick. That's all it was. A damn trick. I raised my hands, and my heart sank. There were manacles around my wrists. The bite of cold at my ankles said I was bound there, too. The room I'd been in moments ago vanished. A concrete floor was beneath me, cracked and stained with dried blood. The walls were now corrugated metal, with windows that were far too dirty to see out of. The ravens remained, perched now on metal beams running the length of the building. Somewhere, water leaked from a pipe, dripping into a puddle I couldn't see. I'm sorry to have to do this to you. The figure before me threw the hood back on her cloak, revealing the face of a young woman. She hadn't been much older than me, a year or two at most. Her blue-black hair framed a delicate face and black, piercing eyes. Fire danced in her irises. She had a raven tattoo on the back of her left hand and an eye on the right. Raven, I whispered. No, this isn't real. You're not here. I'm not here. This isn't real. This is just a memory. She cackled and approached, her cloak dragging through the murky sledge covering the floor. You should have listened to your parents about being wary of strangers. She went on, as if I hadn't spoken at all. Don't worry, the pain won't last long. But I'm afraid we do have to break you before we send you back to them. It's the least we can do for the Vilsaris family. I scrambled backward, but figures surged in from left and right. I was hauled to my feet, and a fist connected with my face. Another struck my stomach. Doubled over, I fought to get free, but there were too many. 
over and over I was punched and kicked, then thrown to the ground. Raven cackled while she watched the spectacle. They jeered and taunted me, telling me I was useless trash who had no magic anyway. They were doing my parents a favor. Somewhere in my mind I knew this had to be fake. I still felt the pain of every blow, just as I had three years ago. I spat blood from my mouth. On the ground I begged them to stop. They had no idea what they were doing, no idea the danger they were in. The whole time they'd been beating on me, the dark hole where my magic resided had begun to brighten. Power pulsed within my core, building and building. I cringed at the heat that flooded my veins, followed by a rush of ice. I knew what came next because I'd lived it before. I think I see a spark, Raven crooned. She leaned over and reached for my hand. My, my, you have magic after all. Stop this, please, I said through my swollen and split lips. Please, I don't want to kill you. Raven threw back her head with a high, shrill laugh. Kill us, oh, my sweet little Megan. You can't hurt us. Grabbing a handful of my hair, she forced my head back and glared into my eyes. But I can hurt you. I can burn your eyes out of their sockets. That was what was done to one of my relatives by one of yours. Perhaps I should return the favor. Fire danced in her eyes. She smiled in malicious glee down at me. A swell of enormous energy surged within me, and there was nothing I could do to hold it back. The power I'd never learned to control exploded out of me. A shield of spirit struck first, throwing Raven and the others back. I slammed my hands to the floor. Every drop of water in the warehouse rose at a command I hadn't given. They twisted and formed jagged spikes of ice that shot through the air, impaling anything in their path. Wind gusted and howled, forming cyclones that swept several of my attackers up in their wake. They screamed until they were bashed into the walls and the ceiling, their bodies broken shells. Raven screamed. Fire formed in her hand. The orb came straight from my head. I caught it, and the flame turned into an inferno that joined the wind. It spread throughout the warehouse, causing nothing but destruction. Bodies fell around me. Shrieks of the dying bombarded my ears. I sat in the middle of the chaos, unable to do anything but watch the power I'd unleashed. Through the agony of my bruised and beaten body, I screamed, straining to call it back to me, to stop it from killing everyone here. I wasn't a killer. I never wanted to use my summoning to hurt anyone. My magic had been forced to stay quiet for too long. It was out, and it wasn't coming back without a fight. And I gave it that fight. I screamed until I was hoarse, focused until I could no longer see straight. Little by little, the power fell under my command once more. It crashed back into me, shooting through my veins and nearly ripping me to pieces in the process. I fell backward, staring up at the ceiling, charred black from the attack. You! Raven rasped from somewhere nearby. I turned my head. It was all I could manage, and there she was, with a spike of ice jutting out from her chest. Blood covered her chin. She tried to speak, but the light left her eyes. She and everyone else in the warehouse were dead. I waited to slip into darkness because that was what came next. The chain between my wrists jerked, and I was sitting upright. Our man crouched before me. I'd never seen him before, but from the way he glared at me, he knew me. You murdered her that day, he said harshly. You killed her. You killed all of them. I opened my mouth to speak. Nothing came out. I don't want to hear your excuses, your lies. All I want to hear are your screams. He leaned in until his face was inches from mine. Cold, dead eyes that threatened to steal my soul drained the warmth from my body. Are you ready for your punishment? Are you ready to be driven mad? He raised his hand and brought it down. He was gone as if he hadn't been there, and the attack by the cloaked figures started all over again. 
I suffer through every painful, horrifying moment again. When it ended the same as it had the first time, I waited for him to return. I waited to find a way out of this illusion. But all it did was start over a third time, then a fourth. This was never going to end. I was trapped in this nightmare. And there was no escaping it. What if I wasn't only manifesting my magic in this illusion, but in the real world too? How many people was I about to hurt or kill? Unable to do anything else, I threw my head back and screamed. Chapter 12 Cody After Megan walked away, the smile fell from my face. It was good to see her relaxing and enjoying the festival. I wanted her to have a good time after all the shit she'd been through. For the most part, she was doing better than I expected her to be around such a big crowd. In the days leading up to the festival, I'd done what I could to act as if everything was fine. There shouldn't have been anything for me to worry over. My cover was intact. The three men who'd been hired to mess with Megan and the others had been caught. The threat was over. And yet there's a loose end. No matter how many times Nick and Luke asked those three about the raven nailed to Megan's wall, their answers never changed. All three claimed they had nothing to do with that. Their main job had been to scare the students into contacting their parents and distracting them from the case they were dealing with involving some underground smuggling ring. That was it. The dead bird nailed to the wall constituted as a scare tactic to me, and yet it had only been done to Megan. I'd asked Nick if he thought there was a fourth person we hadn't found yet. He'd told me they were simply trying to ease their guilt by not fessing up. One of them will finally break, he'd assured me. Trust me, when he does, I'll let you know. I wanted him to be right, but you know he isn't. Now you're being paranoid, I muttered to myself. I went to the stand selling the ciders, bought two, and went to where I said I'd meet Megan. Only she wasn't there. I spun around in a slow circle, taking in the crowd. There was no sign of her. At least ten talons were here tonight, secretly patrolling the festival. Setting the drinks atop the fence surrounding the haunted house attraction, I reached into my pocket for my phone to contact them. Someone had to have eyes on Megan. The ground trembled beneath my feet. With it came the sound of crashes from inside the haunted house. Flashes of orange and red light flickered in the windows. A crowd of students manifested on the ground on either side of it, all of them appearing dazed and like they were going to be sick. What the hell was that? One of the guys muttered. Did we just get teleported out? Another said, clutching a hand to her stomach. I rushed forward to ask them what was going on. Then a scream came from inside the house. Megan! I vaulted the fence and sprinted for the front doors. I reached out with my hands to grab the knobs and throw them open, but they didn't budge. A shimmering shield of spirit energy covered them. While I stepped back to look for another way in, that shield spread to cover the entire house. When the brush of a familiar presence struck me, I stilled. Meg? That couldn't be her magic. She wasn't a spirit summoner. I rested my hand flat against the front door and sucked in a sharp breath. This was from Megan. Whether possible or not, she was using spirit summoning somehow. She screamed again, and I smashed my shoulder into the door, willing it to open. The shield she'd created around the house held. Aiming my hands at the ground, I summoned Earth to shift beneath the house and hopefully loosen her hold. The earth rumbled and heaved under me, sending me staggering back toward the fence. What the hell is happening? I snapped. Cody! I threw a look over my shoulder, not surprised at the sight of Briar and Zack hurrying my way. Meg's inside. I have no idea what's happening to her. Zack frowned and placed his hand against the front door. This is a spirit shield. I know. That doesn't make sense, he muttered. Megan's scream turned into a frantic shriek, setting my blood on fire. I had to get inside. I had to save her from whatever was happening. I rammed into the doors again with Zack beside me. Nothing we did connected with the doors through the shield. Briar told us she was going to try and astral project herself inside to see what was going on. She lowered her head. The faintest outline of her body separated and headed toward the house. She made contact with the shield, and her astral form was thrown back into her body. The fuck? She clutched at her head, giving Zack a wide-eyed stare. 
I turned to the doors once more. There had to be a way to get inside. This is Meg's magic, I whispered and raised my hands. And if it's her magic, then maybe... I trailed off, not bothering to explain to the others what I was going to do. I'm right here, Meg, I said, sending the thought as loud as I could into that shield. You're not alone. Let me in. Let me help you. Don't block me out, please. The shield under my hands gave way. I pushed on the door and it swung inward. I stepped inside, then turned to wave Briar and Zack through. On their approach, the shield forced me into the house and kept them from getting inside, too. Just fine, Megan, Zack told me. We'll try to find another way in. I moved deeper into the front entry. The door tore itself out of my grip and slammed shut. Unsure if it was Megan who did the or was someone else, I reached for the enchanted blade under my jacket. Holding it in my left hand, I stared down the long, twisting corridor. There was a set of stairs to my right, and another hall that veered off to the left. After spotting the flames in the windows, I'd expected to see an easy path to whoever was creating them. But there were only shadows all around me. The only light source came from the floating orange and gray orbs of light. Figuring going straight was the best option. I did so. But the hall didn't remain straight. It twisted and turned and widened into three separate paths. There was no clear way to go, so I picked the one to the left and cursed at the dead end it led me to. Megan's scream bounced around the house, sounding like it was so close and yet so far away. Where the hell was she? Doubling back, I picked the middle corridor and ended up in a room full of mirrors. I didn't have time for this shit. Holding my hand toward the floorboards, I forced my magic through them and down into the earth below. The shield, thankfully, hadn't gone under the house. Clenching my hand into a fist, I raised it up, then spread my fingers wide. Columns of rock and dirt shot upward, shattering the mirrors and destroying the maze of corridors they'd formed in this massive room. Glass was still tinkling to the floor while I moved to the exit, now easily visible to my far right. That short haul dumped me into a room filled with what I assumed were meant to be terrifying visages of phantoms. Ignoring them and their taunting cries, I wove my way around the glass cases filled with macabre objects, all supposedly cursed according to the signs by them. Beyond that room was another, and I had no doubt once I reached the other side, there'd be yet another one. Megan hadn't screamed in a while, but every now and then I caught her shouting words. They were too muffled for me to make them out. What I did hear was panic and fear in her trembling voice. Getting to her was taking too damn long. I'd shouted for her a few times. The lack of response made me assume she wasn't able to hear me, or whoever was here with her, hurting her, stopped her from yelling back. The wall of control around my emotions was ready to crumble into dust. I had to find her. I had to get to her before it was too... A trail of icy wind whispered around my right hand and up my arm, cooling my seething anger ready to break free and take this whole house down with it. I tensed, waiting for that wind to constrict. All it did was give my arm a gentle tug toward the left, as if it was trying to guide me somewhere. I dug my feet in, reluctant to simply go with it if this was a trick. But it was just like the shield that covered the house. Once I focused on that icy touch, I felt Megan within it. I followed the wind, jogging down long stretches of corridors that realistically shouldn't have existed inside this house. A final set of doors were at the end of the corridor the wind had led me to. Beneath them, flickers of red and orange light flashed. The door rattled as if there was a massive windstorm gusting on the other side. With no idea of what I was about to walk into, I readied my blade and kicked the doors open. A rush of freezing air slapped me in the face. The floorboards that had run throughout the rest of the house were nothing but broken shards, thanks to the columns of rock that had risen from underneath. Random bits of fire exploded within the swirling air currents. Ice covered the walls and the ceiling in viciously sharp icicles. Flowing through the chaos was a never-ending stream of nearly invisible spirit energy. Squinting against the wind and pushing my way forward, careful of the uneven floor, I struggled to find the source of so much summoning. Meg? I stared in stunned disbelief. On the floor, curled up on her side, was Megan. 
Manacles were around her wrists and ankles, chaining her in place. I searched, waiting to find whoever had done this to her. But she was alone. This magic, all of it, was coming from her. She rolled to her back. A scream erupted from her mouth, and the five streams of elemental magic strengthened. The wind nearly threw me out of the room. I grabbed hold of the doorframe, using it to keep me upright until the gusts stopped. Icicles crackled into being right beside me. I sidestepped their jagged tips and eased my way closer to Megan. Stop, she yelled. I froze. Was she talking to me? Meg? Throwing her head to the side, she let out a horrible keening sound. Embers rolled down her cheeks like tears. Please just let me go. No, don't. Don't touch me. You'll just make it worse. Stop. Just stop. Her words struck me like a fist to the gut, one after the other. Was she hallucinating? Her eyes were scrunched shut, and the next second she was screaming again for them to get away before it was too late. Before she killed them. Mind racing while I attempted to figure out what she could possibly be seeing right then, I glanced around the room, searching for who did this to her. That was when I spotted the blood on her wrists from the manacles, dripping down her arms and staining her shirt. She was hurt and her summoning was quickly getting out of control. The walls trembled. The roof groaned as if it fought not to collapse. Sheathing my blade, I crossed my arms over my face to block the wind out, and one hard-earned step at a time drew closer. Bursts of fire exploded close by, nearly knocking me over. The heat was intense. That wall of wind and spirit closed in tight around her, protecting her from whatever enemies she was seeing. Meg, I called over the howling wind. Megan, I'm right here. Whatever you're seeing isn't real. Listen to me. I need you to open your eyes. See me. The wind pushed harder against me. I stood my ground. She'd guided me here. She'd let me in the house. Somehow she already knew I was here. I just had to get her to open her damned eyes before the house came down on our heads. She jerked her hands. The manacles dug into her skin and fresh rivulets of blood coated her hands. Don't make me do this, she whispered. Please, I can't stop it. Meg, I yelled again. I made it three more steps, but she was still a couple of yards away from me, too far for me to take hold of her hand. Ice had joined the wind. Each time it blew past my face, the sharp edges slashed into any exposed skin. My face and hands stung from the cuts, but I wasn't about to back down. Unsure what else I could do at this point, I remembered her mantra, the one she always repeated to herself during a panic attack. You're safe. There's no danger. Everything's okay. You just need to breathe. Count to five and breathe. I started the count for her, as I'd done so many times over these last few weeks. By the third round, the wind had died down enough for me to get within a couple of feet. By the fifth, the fires became little more than sparks hovering in the air around Megan. The ice melted, and the water seeped into the earth. The towers of rock broke apart and vanished back through the floorboards. That's it, I said, keeping my tone even. You're safe, Megan. There's no one here but you and me. Open your eyes. Look at me. The spirit energy had condensed, forming a domed shield around her. The pained look on her face gave way to a confused frown. Cody? I pressed my hand gently against the shield. It flexed as if ready to toss me back on my ass. Then Megan's eyes opened. I was mesmerized by the swirl of red, blue, white, green, and yellow in her normally brown irises. She blinked at me and raised her hands. The chain around the manacles clanked. Her eyes went wide, and I knew I was about to lose her. Lunging forward, I caught hold of her right hand and sternly called her name. It's all right now. You're all right. I swear it. You shouldn't be here, she breathed. Too dangerous. The rest of her words trailed off, and she went limp. The last of the summoning magic vanished. The damage to the house had been done, though. It creaked and moaned, ready to fall apart. Working quickly, I reached for the manacles at her wrists first. 
They were magically locked, but no match for my power spurred on in a fit of silent rage. The lock snapped, and the metal gave way. I removed the cuffs from her wrists, cursing at how mangled the skin was there. I made quick work of the ones at her ankles, then hoisted her into my arms. I turned for the door, then stilled. A figure moved out of the corner of my eye to the right. I braced, expecting an attack, but there was nothing. The house shook, and parts of the ceiling caved in, with no time left to try and figure out who else might have been in here. I followed the path I'd taken to get here until the front door was in sight. With the shield gone, Briar and Zack had been able to step inside and stood in the front entry, waving me on to hurry. Outside the house, a crowd had gathered. Headmaster Hook pushed his way to the front of it, spotted me with Megan in my arms, then quickly ushered the crowd back further. There was someone inside, I told Briar and Zack. Take care of her, Zack told me. Briar had already raced off into the house. What is she doing? That place is about to come down, I yelled. Zack clapped me on the shoulder. It won't until she lets it. Get her to the infirmary. He gave Megan a worried glance, then ran into the house after Briar. Hook cleared a path for me through the crowd, ignoring the prying eyes and whispering voices surrounding me. I made for the main building and the infirmary. Not once did Megan stir. Maggie, the summoner who was the head healer for Academy, had taken care of the injuries Megan had sustained from the haunted house. The manacles at her wrists and ankles had left her skin raw and torn in places. Maggie had put a healing salve around all four places and wrapped them in bandages after cleaning them. She told me she'd be fine. I'd believe her once I saw Megan open her eyes. I'd been sitting beside her in the infirmary, waiting for her to wake up and tell me what happened. The words she'd shouted kept replaying inside my head. Someone had been hurting her, and yet she'd been more worried about what she'd do to them. After seeing the magic that existed within her, I could understand why. But now the mystery of who Megan was had only deepened. While Maggie had been cleaning the wounds, she'd had to push up her sleeves and her pants past her ankles. I'd swallowed back a curse, and Maggie had faltered for a moment at the sight of the scars. They were on both arms and legs. We'd exchanged a glance. Then Maggie had gone back to tending the wounds. I'd been able to do little else except wonder what was strong enough to leave scars that appeared to cover her entire body. I took hold of Megan's hand and gave it a gentle squeeze. I need you to wake up, I said sternly. I need to understand what's happening here. What did you see in there? Who did this to you? Megan's hand didn't close around mine, and her eyes remained firmly shut. Behind me, the door to the infirmary opened. Briar and Zack marched in, neither appearing as if they'd sustained any injuries. Well? I asked. The house is a pile of rubble, Briar said. Whatever magic was unleashed in there tore it apart. But there was no one inside. There wasn't even the trace of someone else being there. I put my own shield up the moment you stepped outside, but it's possible they got out before it closed in. So we have nothing to go on, I snapped. Briar's eyes brightened with her inner fire. I started to apologize, but she held up her hand. I get it. Her eyes flicked to Megan on the bed, then to Zack. We've been where you are plenty of times before. We'll figure out who did this to her, Zack assured me. I don't think we caught all the bastards who were doing the pranks and the letters, I said roughly. If they have another partner out there, we'll get them to tell us. I already sent word to my brothers about the situation. They'll want to know what she says the moment she wakes up. Zack hesitated, then asked quietly, She's an Earth Summoner, right? Yeah, why? Out there, when that shield went up, I could have sworn you said that was Megan's magic. I pictured the scene inside the house, how there'd been streams of power rushing around from all five elements, and how all of it had come from Megan. I could sense her inside the house. That was what I meant. I lied, forcing myself not to flinch under his observant stare. Yeah, sure, he replied. We'll be outside the door, speaking to Hook. I waited until they were gone, then let out the breath I'd been holding. Megan wasn't an ordinary summoner. She was far more powerful and dangerous than anyone seemed to realize. Did she know what she could do? 
But if that was true, why did she act like she had no magic at all? Who are you? I whispered, moved closer to the bed, and kept hold of her hand. Chapter 13 Meg A soft light met my eyes after I opened them. It wasn't my dorm. Slowly I glanced around, noting the ache in my head, followed by the burning pain at my wrists and ankles. My scars prickled, then started to throb. I fought through the pain, needing to know where I was. At the sight of other beds, I blinked, confused. The infirmary? I whispered. Meg. To the right of the bed, Cody sat in a chair. His forehead was wrinkled, and the rest of his face was set in a scowl. He was holding my right hand, a steadying energy that stopped me from panicking. Or at least it did until I remembered where I'd seen him last. And what I'd seen before he'd rushed in to save me. Raven. I'd watched Raven die by my hand, over and over again, her and all the others. That day. I'd been made to relive that day. Why? I strained to remember what happened, but everything was a damn blur inside my head. All I could remember clearly was how out of control my magic had been. Then, seeing Cody standing over me. You were inside the house. The blood drained from my face. You... Are you insane? Why would you do that? Why did you rush in there like that? You could have gotten yourself killed. I yanked my hand away, and he let me. Bits and pieces of the attack came back to me, but little else. How had we gotten out of the house? Then that was you, he said quietly. You summoned all five elements. I swallowed hard. Cody, I swear on my life not to tell another soul what I saw. He assured me. I blinked, not sure I heard him correctly. Why? It's not my secret to tell. You can't be real, I blurted, then sat up and pushed myself as far away from him as I could on the bed. You shouldn't have gotten so close to me. You shouldn't have gone in after me. I hugged my knees, realizing how terrible last night could have gone. Raven's face flashed into my mind. I jumped with a curse. She wasn't here. She was dead, and she was staying dead. Why had I been forced to relive all that? Why? What happened? Cody asked. How did you get inside the house? Does it matter? I need to know who did this to you. He took a deep breath in and added, I need to know why you were screaming about someone needing to let you go. I couldn't stop the shaking that took hold of me. By the time Cody had reached me, I'd lost count of how many times I'd watched my power run rampant through that warehouse, murdering everyone in its path. Too bad there was no going back to change the ending. Some stories are better left buried, I whispered. Not if it's part of why this shit's been happening to you. That last message on your wall with the raven, it meant something to you. And now this? I can't help you if you don't tell me the truth. The truth gets people killed, I said, repeating the words my parents had told me over and over for years. You think I'd have learned my lesson by now? I can take care of myself. Can you, against someone like me? You're still the same woman to me. There's just another piece of the puzzle falling into place now. He tried to reach for my hand, but I tucked it out of reach. Meg, please, talk to me. No, this is too much. Whatever's going on with me, it's my problem. I won't have anyone else getting hurt. I said, pushing the words out despite the pain they caused me. I need you to leave me alone from now on. It'll be safer for you. I can't do that. You don't get it, I yelled. I'm dangerous. I can't tell you why, but I am. Last night, my not hurting you was a fluke. I won't risk you again, so please just leave me alone. Yeah, I'm gonna just up and walk away from you when there's obviously someone out there who wants to hurt you, he ranted. The stone walls of the infirmary trembled, as did the floor. That was the first time I'd ever heard him raise his voice. It couldn't be because of how much he cared for me. It couldn't. We'd hardly been together for a couple of months. You can and you will. I don't want you getting hurt because of me, I insisted. 
too fucking bad, princess. Why are you doing this? Why are you making this so hard? I shouted. You can't be near me, so leave me alone. I can't. Yes, you can. You just won't. Why do you keep pushing for answers, huh? Why do you care so much? Some asshole is being an asshole. It has nothing to do with you. It does when it's my job to protect you, he yelled, then cursed and turned his back to me. The truth behind his words slammed into me. No, I breathed. You... No. Please tell me you're not. Not what? He asked, his voice far too calm. They brought you here. They said they'd leave me alone, and you... I shook my head, struggling to get the rest of the words out. You're not a real student, are you? Cody remained silent, but at least he turned around. Answer me, damn it! I shouted, chucking a pillow at him. Who are you? Technically speaking, I'm a Talon, he said. I work as an undercover bodyguard. I was brought in to watch over you while you're at Academy, a request placed by your parents with my superior, General Pierce. Is that what you wanted to know? A Talon. He was a damn Talon. The parts of Cody I hadn't figured out started to make sense. How he was so damn good at summoning, and how he'd caught the stalker the other night. The way he acted most of the time, as if he was looking out for potential dangers. Meg, do you get this close to all your charges? What? No. Everything that happened between us was real, all right? I wasn't even supposed to get close to you. I was ordered to keep my distance. But you didn't. Another thought struck me, and I sat up straighter. How much do you know about me? Obviously not enough, he uttered, crushing the pillow between his hands. This is not how I wanted you to find out the truth, but clearly I'm not the only one with secrets. You can't know mine. It's safer that way. His eyes rolled toward the ceiling, and the ground trembled even more. Was I ever going to find out about you? What would have happened if my parents suddenly yanked me out of Academy? Were you going to follow me? I hadn't gotten that far. Right, because I was, what, a little extra fun while you were stuck with the boring assignment? Guard the council member's daughter who doesn't have magic? That's not what happened. Lies, so many fucking lies, between the ones I had to tell others and the ones my parents told me to my face, and now Cody, the one person on campus I thought I could trust, and he turned out to be a bodyguard. He was another person only in my life because of what I was, and he didn't even know the whole story. As far as I was concerned, he wasn't going to. Get out, I whispered. Megan, he started, but I chucked another pillow at his head. I said, get out. If that's what you want, then fine. But I'm not going anywhere. And this conversation is far from over. He walked by the bed, placing both pillows at the end of it. It's all real for me, he added quietly. All of it. I'm not simply going to walk away from what we have. It was a lie, I replied. All of it's a lie. He opened his mouth like he was going to argue, then closed it and walked for the door. At the threshold, he turned back toward me. Hook and the Pierce brothers will want to speak with you about what happened. And Hook has contacted your parents. All he told them was you were involved in an accident on campus and that you were injured. Whatever happens next, I'll be here for you. I lay down and turned my back to him. The infirmary door opened and closed. I tugged the blanket up to my chin and fought against the confused and furious tears burning in my eyes. I wanted to believe him. I did. I wanted to believe that everything we shared was real. But how could I? What's the point anyway? You saw what he did for you. He'll end up getting hurt. And it'll be your fault. The horrors I'd been made to see all over again taunted me from the shadows of the room. I'd done that. I'd killed them. And their blood would be on my hands forever. If Cody ever learned the truth of what I'd done and who I was, he'd want nothing to do with me. It was far better to put a stop to this relationship now. Far better to be alone, I whispered, pulled the blanket up over my head, and tried to tune out the ghosts of the past from driving me crazy. The first tears slipped down my cheeks, and all I could think of was how I wished Cody had stayed. End of Book Nine
And this has been Vigilance, Another Generation, Academy of Ancients, Book 9, written by Avery Cross, narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Copyright 2023 by Avery Cross. Production copyright by Avery Cross.